encountered a problem. While the elephant could get his head in the door, he could go no further. It's a good thing we made this door expandable to accommodate my woodshop equipment, the giraffe said. Give me a minute while I take care of our problem. He removed some bolts and panels to allow the elephant in. The elephant and giraffe were happily sharing woodworking stories when a call came in for the giraffe from his boss. As the giraffe went upstairs to answer the call, the elephant spotted a project in the far corner. He tried to go through another doorway to look at it, but he got stuck and broke the frame of the doorway. He then decided to go upstairs to let giraffe know, but as he stepped on the stairs, he heard them crack. At this point, giraffe made his way back downstairs and asked, what on earth happened here? I was trying to make myself at home, the elephant said. The giraffe looked around. Okay, I see the problem. The doorway, it's too narrow. We have to make you smaller. There's an aerobic studio near here. If you take some classes there, we could get you down to size. And the stairs are too weak to carry your weight, the giraffe continued. If you go to ballet classes at night, I'm sure we can get you light on your feet. I really hope you'll do it. I like having you here. Perhaps, the elephant said. But to tell you the truth, I'm not sure that a house designed for a giraffe would ever really work for an elephant, not unless there are some major changes. In our story, the giraffe represents how we sometimes want to address inequities and or differences. The elephant is warmly invited and generally welcomed, but is expected to miraculously change to accommodate a situation that was not built for his unique characteristics. As a faith community, we chose to examine our house to determine what structures we have in place that limit the movement of student achievement and growth. We want to know in what ways we have made the people the problem instead of altering the structures. We wanted to uncover the ways in which the giraffe and elephant scenario may be present in our school community. Therefore, we are engaging three groups in dialogue. One for our staff, one for our parents, and one in development for our students. Joining me tonight are fave teachers and parents to share a few words about our work. Good evening. Good evening. Okay, so I have a little prop here. So this is important for me to uh, say my message here tonight. So um, I'm gonna talk to you about the uh, book, uh, Courageous uh, Conversations. So what I have here, dice in my ass. I was expecting this to right here. <laughs> so these dice, they represent the staff members uh, prior to uh, being int introduced to this uh, wonderful work here. And so now, this as we are now. We move around the marbles now. And so those represent what this, uh, uh, this great book has done for our staff. So for one, it, um, it helped us to look at uh, difficult uh, conversations about race, uh, about inequity, about the uh, achievement gap. And uh, this is some of the things we've been looking at for years and years, and it's uh, continuing to be a problem in our uh, district. But uh, what this book has been able to glean out is uh, looking at uh, what are we doing, you know, as teachers, as educators, uh, uh, how are we interacting with student, students. So it presents like uh, different scenarios uh, for us to think about uh, how we are going about in our day-to-day -day, uh, activities. You know, uh, did I say something that may have a, a racial uh, a ramifications or uh, how is uh, uh, the distribution of uh, calling on students? You know, just being able to uh, think about that in a more uh, conscious way. And um, I think the best thing that came out of this was uh, something from my leader, uh, Ms. Newton, was, uh, being able to say oh, it's okay if it's non-closure, you know, uh, mm -hmm. not teachers. We're, we're so often uh, uh, feel like we need to have an answer to everything, every problem that comes up, but uh, all problems may not be able to be solved uh, immediately or uh, with some kind of panacea. So I think that uh, 
that's what it's opened our eyes up to. And so I'm grateful to that, and I think we still have a lot of work ahead of us. Do I have more time? Oh, no. Am I done? Okay. Okay. All right. I like the manipul manipulatives. Oh. Teach them. Thanks. <laughs> Good evening. Um, my name is Vanessa Williams. I teach fourth grade over at Fave. And um, I think, honestly, what a book like Courageous Conversation does is it gives us a, a platform and kind of a framework in which to work. Um, I think it gave people an opportunity to feel like they had a, a space to speak in. And what it did was it actually kind of gave us um, parameters, like um, it's okay to be uncomfortable. Um, as Russell said, it, give, it said that, um, you know, we're necessarily not going to um, solve any problems here. And to speak your truth. So I think those really help teachers feel like they could speak their, uh, from their experiences. Um, teachers are people too. Um, we come with our own set of preconceived notions. We come with our own perspectives. We come with our own ideas. And a lot of times, um, maybe teachers aren't allowed to feel like they should think that way. But I think what a book like this does, it allows us to have those kind of tough conversations and realize that everyone has their own um, perceptions about race. And it's always good to have those conversations. It's good to talk about them and to feel comfortable that you're being heard. Not necessarily that you're changing anyone's mind, but you're giving someone a different perspective. And that's what we need sometimes to think. Not necessarily, I can't put myself in your shoes, but I can hear your experiences and I can accept them and respect them. Um, more than anything else, even if I don't agree with them, I can't accept and respect them. So I think that's what the book did. It gave us that type of platform to use as a parameter to have those conversations and feel comfortable with each other and having them. So, thank you. Thanks. Hi, good evening. I believe I have the pleasure of knowing most of you, but I'm Krista Sobin. I'm a double fave parent with fourth grade and fifth grade daughters at fave. Uh, so, We've also had the opportunity this semester to participate in um, facilitated conversations about the book, The Hate You Give. Um, Dr. Sean Warner has been our facilitator, um, sponsored by the PTO, I have to say that. Um, <laughs> uh, but it's been, uh, there was, uh, the school did an excellent job of soliciting parent involvement, made it very clear that the expectation was five two-hour sessions and that we would have to put ourselves in a place where we were not always going to be very comfortable and we were going to discuss some really sensitive topics and so a group of moms and dads and guardians have shown up and we've had some conversations the first meeting of course there's a little bit of timidity um, we've learned a little bit about district statistics about some of the achievement gap um, but since then we're now we've had three sessions and we've really gotten into some very meaty topics we've discussed um, the history of blackface we've discussed um, code switching that sometimes our black students have to do between um, maybe their home life and their school life. We've discussed um, even something as um, and seemingly innocuous as the young lady that was cast in the movie versus how the character is portrayed on the book. Um, and the young lady in the movie is actually a little bit lighter skinned than the character is. Um. This is the goal of our justice board. As part of the Justice Board, the students will be trained to help others verbalize their concerns that they see and experience. Um, we'll be working to teach kids how to communicate what they need and also to advocate for themselves effectively. <clears throat> um, the work has started with a small group of students, it's fifth and sixth graders, um, who are working on a podcast to tell their story. Um, our title is Voice. And while we have several students who are telling stories about race, there are others working on issues of gender and disability because kids. Um, some of the others, some of the stories our children are telling are about being a black gifted student who is always in trouble because he challenges authority. Um, being an Asian student who is automatically assumed to be smart and expected to perform a certain way. Um, being a student with ADHD and anxiety who struggles with deadlines and organization but is overly worried about what other people think and is often paralyzed with fear. Um, the goal of this work is to help the teachers and other adults start to understand what our kids are seeing and feeling. Um, one of my kids said, um, we may all have the same skin color or disability, but that doesn't mean we're all the same. And I thought that was very powerful. Um, one of my students has volunteered to share her story. Um, this is Sydney, and she's going to come up and share what she's written. So my name is Sydney. Um, <laughs> Okay, 
I remember when I was in preschool, people in our class would ask me, which one of your parents is white? Because they thought I was mixed. Honestly, I thought this was a joke. When I was young, when I thought this was a joke when I was young. So I would laugh it off. But now that I think about it, it's very offensive. Because just because I look a certain way doesn't mean I am a certain way. When people told me, when, when I told people none of my parents were white, they would get so shocked I can see where they were confused. I felt like... I felt like I was supposed to be something I'm not. As I got older and more mature, I realized that just people, just because people think I'm one thing doesn't mean I should be that. And so to wrap it up, our um, anticipated, yes, let's go sit here. <laughs> our anticipated outcomes are to raise teacher, parent, guardian awareness of the inequities at FAVE and in our school district. Thank you. <laughs> to reflect on self-perceptions of how racially, culturally, and linguistically motivated oppressive practices, policies, challenge, equity in our schools. And to begin a framework in shared language to discuss issues of race, power, and privilege with FAVE school personnel, students, and families. Thank you so much. That was awesome. Thank you. you have questions? I, I bet there's going to be some questions for y'all if you want to stay <laughs> Um, I had a quick question. Um, well, first I will say thank you for a great presentation. And I will say that um, I believe a, a student can have kind of this perfect world when he's got the support of family and the support of his school district as, as well as his actual school. And I know growing up in school and talking about race issues at my at the dinner table with my family, but it was never discussed at school. It was never discussed on this level. And so I am proud to see that the discussions are continuing to happen in all three realms so that our particular students will know that they are supported and thought of. Um, this question is for anybody, but I'm just curious as to maybe what some of your biggest takeaways or aha moments or something you just absolutely didn't know that you learned from attending some of these classes or whatever, I'm sorry, whatever you call them. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Again, with the person who doesn't like being in front of the mic. Um, I think for me, it just affirmed what I already want to do with students and with parents and with my coworkers. It gave us a framework to work from, to have conversations. Um, I think often with these conversations, people get uncomfortable and then they shut the conversations down. And so I feel like being that it's out there and that we are all engaged in it gives everybody kind of that push to the people that are really strong and wanting to do it, lets us do it and then have the other people kind of understanding where we're coming from. Mm -hmm. I think for me it was really a lot of introspection on the, the code switching discussion that we had. I don't think that I had an appreciation, well I think I was aware that code switching happened. I don't think I had an appreciation until our discussion of the, the stress and the, and the heaviness that that must feel like for an 11 year old or 9 year old or 10 year old. Um, so -year -old. yeah. <laughs> or more mature. <laughs> um, so I think that that's probably just um, all of the extra that they come to school with every day that has nothing to do with anything I and mean, any the other um, challenges that might be faced. So I think for me, that's probably the biggest takeaway I've had. I think for me, it's been really good to have conversations about um, race and issues of equity with people outside of my own circle that I wouldn't necessarily converse with other parents. Um, you know, naturally, when I'm with my friends of color, we talk about race, it just comes up because of who we are. Um, and we confront these issues every day. But I don't do that in my own community where I live. And so I think it's been really good for me to have a space to be able to do that. Um, and it's been uncomfortable, but it's been really good. i say for me, it was uh, just those moments of uh, what I call uh, when people realize they're using what I call uh, recreational uh, bigotry. That's the term I use, uh, which may be just an innocuous uh, exchange, and they may not realize, okay, I didn't realize that, uh, you know, saying X, Y, Z could be perceived that way. Because mm -hmm. sometimes people may not know, you know. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I mean, there's, 
not everyone. I'm not going to give everyone a pass on all uh, interactions. <laughs> but um, there are some that may be genuinely uh, just naive. Right. So uh, just being aware of that uh, and uh, knowing that uh, your colleague may not always know because that did come up in conversation. Oh, I didn't know that saying uh, this can be uh, perceived or taken in that, in that manner. Mm-hmm. You know, because you know, uh, you may not necessarily, you're not walking in that person's shoes. You know, even though you may see uh, documentaries or watch whatever, it's still different or it's received different. Mm-hmm. So, differently, I should say. Okay. Did you guys do the Beyond Diversity training? Was that part of some of the work that you've done? Just we will be doing you it. are doing it. Okay. All right. Um, well, I wanted to thank Mrs. Newton because I know your work started two and three years ago um, when I was serving with you on the SLT and I consider you an early adopter of this book and sharing it with your staff and being a strong leader and making it a priority so thank you for doing that and thank you both to Mr. Stewart and Mrs. Prophet for also being leaders and um, Mrs. Williams sorry for also being leaders in your school Uh, and um, my question is for Mrs. Prophet Um, I'm very interested in how you are capturing the voices of the students and how we're going to be able to share that with teachers. Um, and can you just expand on that a little bit, how teachers may be at FAVE and maybe other schools within our school system will be able to benefit from that? So the thinking is that we're going to get it into a podcast form so that we can continue to have this happening um, and be able to share it digitally with people. Um, that's not my expertise on the tech side, so um, we would have to work that out. But. One of the reasons that I wanted to include some of the sixth graders is because a lot of the work I did last year with the fifth graders that are now sixth graders related to race, I wanted them to be able to kind of start to tell their stories as well. So um, that's my goal is to have it in podcast form so that people can listen and kids can continue to share their stories as they learn what their story might be. Um, Because sometimes they don't know. They don't recognize that, hey, this might be part of my story. So. I think that answers your question. <laughs> I was just going to add, um, first of all, it sounds like you guys have really gone deep and not just kind of scratched the surface in areas that are um, hard to converse about, but it's so productive and helpful. And I love that you're engaging the students in this too, because I also think it can help parents and their children have um, productive conversations. And I just wanted to tell um, Sid, oh no, did she leave? She oh no. <laughs> Shoot. Well, tell Sydney and Sydney that well, Sydney that she did a great job, and Sydney's mom too. She should be very proud. It was that's very brave and courageous. Mm-hmm. Thinking of mm-hmm. courageous conversations for um, a fifth grader to come and speak to a board on such a sensitive and challenging topic. Mm-hmm. So, um, I, thank you. Um, it isn't lost on me that the giraffe and the elephant. The elephant is the elephant in the room, right? <laughs> Um, and one of the things that the Beyond Diversity training allows us to do is talk about the elephant in the room, but talking about the elephant in the room doesn't solve the problems. It allows the problems to begin to be <coughs> solved. So as, as you said, there's still a lot of work to do. Um, I'm amazed that you got people to sign on for 10 hours of you know, their lives to, to do to a deep dive on this, and I think that we should challenge ourselves to do at least as much. Um, mm-hmm. You know, it's really easy to put the Beyond Diversity training on the shelf as opposed to make sure that it's right in front of us and that we're using it. Um, so I really appreciate you. I mean, you're already doing this. Um, so I really appreciate it. Thank you. I mean, <clears throat> I'll just echo everything that's been said. I thought that this was a great, it's very encouraging to see all of this happening. And is this the first, are you all the only ones who are doing this sort of facilitated discussion involving parents and, and, and staff to really dive into these issues? They're not the only ones, but they're the early adopters. FAVE has been doing this work before, I think, pretty much any other school in the district, like Heather was saying, and so they're much further along in the process than a lot of other schools are. It just, I mean, this is what we need to be doing community-wide. We need to, you know, really scale this up. I've been participating in a similar group in my neighborhood that was, uh, and I can just attest how difficult it is to, uh, it's very, valuable, but it's really hard to make it work. And so I'm glad that y'all are finding a way. And one question I had was <clears throat> how these are facilitated. The parent group or is who's providing the facilitation? 
As um, Krista said, we are fortunate that our PTA paid for an expert facilitator. His name is Dr. Sean Warner. He is a professor at Clark Atlanta University, but he actually lives in DC. So he is, he comes down at the beginning of the semester to set up his classes and then he conducts them remotely. And so when he is in town, maybe not. Anyway, he works it out and he facilitates our parent discussion for us because we felt like we needed someone with expertise in order to do We really do me. need an expert. How many, how many parents are participating in these? We have about 25 that signed up consistently, probably 15. Huh? That's good. That's mm -hmm. Yeah, and so I think that's just really wonderful. So thank you all for what you're doing. I really love that story. Mm -hmm. Oh, did you? Thank you for that. I'll too. send you the full story because that was the, the condensed version. But please do. I thought <laughs> right. it was good. <laughs> Send it to all of us. Yes, yeah. please do. I have one other question for the Justice Board, <coughs> which I think is funny because I, I can imagine like a panel of superheroes. <laughs> <laughs> it's funny because I am a big superhero <laughs> fan. <laughs> <laughs> is, it, is this a discussion group? Or are they so it's a little bit of, um, right now it's like teaching kids how to speak and share what they are personally experiencing. Um, because I've had several students come to me, like my student last year who said that nobody will listen to me. Mm -hmm. um, and giving them kind of, training them in tools that will get them heard. Mm -hmm. um, because a lot of times our students have a lot of trouble being heard because of the way that they address adults. So that's the first task. And then ultimately our goal is to be able to have a place where Students, when they see something or they feel something in class, that they could bring it to us as a group and we could help them talk through it so that they could eventually handle it on their own. It's kind of learning how to advocate for yourself. It's really wonderful. You know, when we get to the point where we're working on the social and emotional learning, I think it'd be really important for us to find a way to make sure that we meet the intersection of that and cultural humility mm -hmm. and the equity work what you were saying about being able to advocate for yourself and teaching the skills to do that. Um, and I, you know, for me, one of the things you said about, you know, partially code switching, but the idea that, that students aren't accepted for who they are just walking in the door, that they have to fit into the system. Uh, we need to, I, I really appreciate the work you're doing on that as well and uh, challenge you to challenge us um, on ways that we can change the system. Um, because it doesn't fit everybody. Thank you. All right. Thank you all. Thank you guys. Okay. Uh, the next on our agenda is the public comment, I think, right? So we have two, Fanta Cowens and Mauli Davis. Uh, with Fanta first, please. And the, the, we have a, it's the three minute time period for the comment. Hi, I'm Fonta Cowens, uh, the first grader at Winona Park. Um, so let me just start by saying that I read, uh, Mr. Mr. Duty, Dr. Duty, I read your, your post a um, couple weeks back regarding as you stated at your white privilege, and I can appreciate your attempt to self-reflect. However, after reading the post, it was clear to me that you still don't get where this all began to go wrong. And frankly, it's made me question the progress of all of the training that you all have talked so much about um, to all of the black parents and all of the other parents that have come during these meetings. In the last meeting, you stated that when you read the email chain, it happened exactly the way it should have happened. You said that the teachers were very well meaning, trying to teach our kids how to be responsible by having them return, I believe what you call it, notification forms, even though they had to be signed uh, to the teachers. And this was regarding a activity that was held um, on school campus, I believe in the cafeteria, um, for Black History Month. When I heard you say that everything happened the way it was supposed to, and these teachers were all mean, my first thought was, are, are you kidding me? Um, this was well-meaning. That, that the teachers required a permission slip or, or a notification form, whatever you want to call it, that that's required to teach students black history, month, black history culture, black history, um, excuse me, black history and culture during, of all times, February. 
As far as I know, our children are not required or even asked to provide a signed notification form to learn white history or white culture. These teachers are they not concerned about teacher responsibility when the lesson plan covers white history or white culture. It was only when the curriculum covered black history that all of a sudden a form was needed. So when you say that to a room of concerned parents in your district that everything happened the way it was supposed to have happened, we have a problem with that because you're supposed to be leading the ship and it doesn't even seem like you know the issue. Last meeting you said, we hope we can do better. We, we can keep hoping and we can keep training our staff and parents and faculty members, but at some point, and I believe that point is now, I believe that point is today, I believe that point was yesterday. We need to see you guys actually doing better. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to come back in um, as one of the co-chairs and Ingram Myrick, um, the other co-chair of Beacon Hill, and just again reiterate our commitment. Um, we're here. Um, I know that at times it's a, been a defensive kind of posture um, that some board members have taken, even Dr. Duty and in, in some of our communications. We're, we're here. We, we have to be here. This has to be addressed. We're committed. We're gonna keep coming. We're gonna keep addressing it. When we see it, we're gonna call it. And just, you know, we're not doing it. I mean, we're doing it for the children, right? I mean, you all, everybody here is, is, is engaged for the children. That's the only reason we're here is not, I mean, have a ton of other kind of commitments that we could be engaged in, but we're here for the children. And so, like, we really need everybody to kind of process that and embrace that and, and just stop being defensive about our presence and our advocacy. No one would be upset um, if something were happening to white children and, and folks stepped up and advocated. No, you, everyone would just say, yeah, that makes perfectly sense. But when we do it, it just feels like there's this pushback, and it doesn't need to be, right? Because the evidence is there, we all agree. So, you know, we're can't, we can't go sit in the corner and just wait. We're gonna have to stay engaged. That's, that's everyone has a role in this process. That's our role. You know, our hope is that it can continue to move in a productive way. You know, we haven't come in and, and tried to take over the, and, and do sit-ins, I've done all of that stuff. I mean, that is within, what we can do, but we haven't done that, right? And so when we come and talk, don't flip out on us talking, right? <laughs> I mean, because we can all escalate and, and create a real, much more uncomfortable situation than it is, and we haven't done that because we've tried to move in community. And so we would like for you all to respect that we're trying to move in community, but at some point, young people are still being impacted on a daily basis. And while I think we're trying to work at the top level, every one of those schools, there are teachers, there are administrators who are not champions of a change of culture. They are not. So we really need whoever at the school level are not champions. That should be our measuring stick. We can get people to teach, we can get people to administrate, but we have to find champions of justice in the schools that they just look like they are engaged with all of the children and they make it um, make us all comfortable we don't have that right now in every school and it's not you, you, you and I know I'm out of time but it's important that you get we can find a teacher that can teach all of the white kids that's easy it happens every day in America we have to find a teacher and administrators who are willing to teach all of the children and make it a priority thank you Superintendent's comment. All right, I have a couple of things. I wanted to give an update on um, 
the investigation that we did into the, the concerns that were raised by Beacon Hill. Um, and so we did, uh, uh, Dr. Huddleston and I conducted an investigation of that and found out that there were definitely some missteps as were um, shared in that letter of, um, we understand why the, prevent, the form went home as a permission form. It was an error that should have been caught and wasn't. Um, and of course, the, we would not require permission for an activity like that. So we followed up with the school on how that error happened and how to stop that from happening again. Um, we had some conflicting value systems in terms of teaching kids responsibility um, and accountability. And so um, when it looked like a permission slip, there were teachers who felt like we've been working hard to make sure kids are accountable. And when you need a slip, you need a slip. And we're trying to hold them accountable for that. Um, and they also failed to recognize the impact on that. So, um, and then with culture of caring, we had um, several issues where um, some events, they tend to get canceled at the last second because it's difficult for groups to handle groups the size of ours. Um, and also some students um, were, were told very soon before the event that they weren't able to go because of behavior issues. And those <laughs> expectations had not been communicated well in advance of, if you fit these criteria, you might not be able to go based on your behavior. So that's a quick summary of the investigation. I just wanted you all to know that that has been followed up on and we'll continue to work with the school to try to avoid problems like that in the future. So um, the, um, we are in the midst of the staffing season. And so if you're watching our website at all, you'll see there's lots of positions going up. Things are moving along really well. We're far ahead of where we've ever been at this point in the past. Um, we have really tried hard to, to push the process back. So we're the first choice for teachers um, and other staff before other school districts scoop them up. We had a very successful career fair, thanks to David Adams and his staff and all the principals who showed up and we had SLT members show up and we had over 100 people, I think, show up to the career fair, which is fantastic. It was a really good turnout. Um, we got some really good contacts through that. Um, so staffing is, is going really, it's going well, but it is an ongoing process and will continue throughout the entire spring. So um, just if you know people who are looking for positions or who may be interested in moving, um, make sure you're mentioning that there are lots of openings that they may be able to move into. The budget prep is going really well. Um, I meant to look at the exact meeting. I think it may be the next meeting. Is Susan here? The next meeting, right? When we um, will be bringing a, a first draft of the budget. Um, so we've had schools are working hard on their requests and, and we're pulling it all together. And so I'm looking forward to bringing that to you all as well. Um, and then finally, I just wanted to read you quickly a, a blog post um, rather than try to summarize. I'm just gonna read this to you just so you, you know where we are in terms of of some of the work we've been doing um, regarding school start and end times. Um, so this is just a post that is going up on my um, blog. So opening a new building and rezoning the district provided me an opportunity to take a closer look at several issues across the district, including start and end times for each school level, work hours for staff, and the difference in the amount of time individual teachers spend providing instruction versus time allocated to planning. Each school level has different state requirements for the length of the school day, and I believe that CSD can create fair expectations for students in regards to instructional time and for staff in regards to planning time. And I share a chart of our start and end times and employee hours. One reason to review start and end times was due to their impact on busing. After reviewing three different bus routing options and corresponding changes to start and end times, I decided that our current start and end times will remain in effect for the upcoming 2019-2020 school year. All of the scenarios we examined required extra buses and bus drivers, so there was not a need to change start um, and end times in relation to transportation efficiency. With start and end times remaining the same, the issue of inequity across the district for teachers regarding work hours and instructional versus planning time remains. So between now and December, we will review start and end times from instructional and employment perspectives to see if there are any changes we would like to implement for the 2020-2021 school year. In the meantime, for next year, we'll reiterate some expectations to bring as much consistency as we can for our employees, including ensuring that our supervisors honor the expectation of a 40-hour work week for our staff. For example, for schools that have a weekly staff meeting requiring staff to stay a given time past the time the workday would typically end, they will need to find an equal amount of time elsewhere in the week to allow those staff to come in late or leave early. Such changes will need to be communicated with impacted staff long before they are implemented in order to allow <coughs> sufficient time for planning. 
Finally, as I've shared previously, if we want our teachers and students to continue to improve, we need to provide our staff with more protected time for professional learning and for parent-teacher conferences. There are several options that I've been considering for the upcoming school year and beyond, and we will soon be sending out a survey to our stakeholders to gather input on these options. So just wanted to, um, some of that you've heard, some of that you haven't, um, but just wanted to make sure everyone is aware of where we're going there. That'll go up on my blog, and I'll also send that around to staff so they all get the same update. So. That's all from my update for today. A quick follow-up. Oh, were you going to? Um, you mentioned the budget. Are we doing a budget day in April? I can't remember. Susan? Are we doing a budget day in April? I can't remember the calendar. Do we have that calendar? I think it's, an, it's not, we're not doing the during the day thing like we used to do. Okay. It's a work session. Okay. Oh. Yep. Got it. Okay. Thank you. All right. So next is the chair's report. Bear with me. I have a few things uh, this week. Um, first, I'd just say to Ms. Cowens and Mr. Davis to, you know, thank you for being here. Um, we do appreciate that you're coming. We understand and want you to c keep coming and keep holding us accountable. I think to a person, the board appreciates the spirit that y'all bring to this, appreciate the, the way that you're engaging with us, um, and, and just want it to continue. I mean, we're not perfect. You're not perfect. It's a partnership. We need to work together. We need to keep working at it. And if it seems that we're defensive sometimes, I mean, sometimes the fact is that people of goodwill can fail. And um, sometimes that's because people of goodwill you know, it's hard to change an organization. It takes time. If it were easy, we would have done it decades ago. But we are, to a person, uh, have embraced this need. We understand the need, and we, ha and we are doing our level best to address it. And we're going to keep trying, and we're going to keep failing. But you just need to come, keep coming. We just need to keep working together. So, um, I'll also say that, <clears throat> and I regarding the investigation that was done, um, I think that you guys would be very, very pleased to see how those allegations <coughs> were investigated. This was a model thorough investigation that took the concerns to heart and took a deep dive to say what went wrong. It was very critical and, in, and, um, and, and reflective and, and honest, and I appreciate um, the spirit with, with which that was done. Thanks. Mm -hmm. um, m moving to other topics, <coughs> um, first on the list is the DHS, the Decatur High School production of The Little Mermaid. Um, I encourage all of you to go. Um, show, the show starts on March 14th and it runs through the 24th. You can go to decaturperforms.org to purchase tickets. These shows almost always sell out because they're good. They're really, really good. This is great entertainment. And, um, and you should go because it's, you're going to enjoy it. You should also go to support the kids and support the staff that have put a lot of effort into the production. Um, on a related note, I happened to attend a luncheon yesterday at the Woodruff Arts Center that was focused on their educational outreach programs, and in particular, they have a close partnership with the city of Atlanta um, with a lot of sort of in-school opportunities where the theater people come and work with the kids in the schools, same with the symphony, <coughs> um, and there's also visual arts programs, and it was really great. One of the things they rolled out at the luncheon was the results of a study that they had commissioned from the <coughs> University of Arkansas in partnership with Woodruff and the Atlanta public school system finding that this engagement, the opportunity to experience uh, the exposure to the arts uh, and the access to the arts through these programs turned out to have a very significant in impact on s standardized test scores uh, in subjects that would seem to be unrelated like, you know, math and reading. And I guess, you know, I don't, I need to read the study to understand more about it, but it's in teaching empathy and other th things uh, that bring these kids a different approach to their other schoolwork. Anyway, I just think it's one reason 
that we should continue to emphasize the arts and not consider it just an afterthought, but a really essential part of the whole child education that we're trying to provide. R on a related note, I hope that we will <coughs> explore these programs that Woodruff Arts Center is offering and make sure that we're, you know, if any are right for us, that we're taking full advantage of them. Um, next, the fifth grade uh, had a night of expressions at, uh, at FAVE. There was a fifth grade night of expressions at FAVE. Uh, this was a culturally significant and I am told a very well done uh, uh, event. The highlight of the evening was a black history performance called Through the African Diaspora. It was written and directed by fifth grade teacher uh, Nyla Carty, and it was performed by many dozens of students. It included short skits depicting significant events in African American history, including music and culture with live drumming, singing, and dancing. And again, I'm, I'm told that this was just fantastic, so congratulations. Um, there's also a family engagement and uh, learning at Oakhurst. Oakhurst Elementary has held its first family STEAM night recently with over 150 participants rotating through a variety of stations which promoted scientific thinking and problem solving. Uh, so the activities included boat building, marble runs, squishy circuits, coding, wiggle boats, and more. STEAM night also included an introduction to the Oakhurst Inclusion Project. So family STEAM night and the Oakhurst Inclusion Project are two of our equity initiatives for this year. Um, the Decatur High School, congratulations to DHS for being named an AP Honor School. Um, Superintendent Woods and the Georgia Department of Education announced that honor uh, recently. And uh, DHS was recognized in the following categories. We're an AP Merit School. That means that we have at least 20% of our total student population taking AP exams and at least 50% of all AP exams uh, earning scores of three or higher. We're also an AT STEM school, which means that um, we have students testing in at least two AP math courses and at least two AP science courses. And we don't just send them to the tests, they do very well, and that's why we're also recognized as an AP STEM achievement school. And STEM achievement schools are STEM schools that have at least 40% of AP math and AP science exams earning scores of three or higher. So congratulations to uh, the staff and students at DHS. Uh, I love this one. Uh, Glenwood Elementary was recently named a kindness certified school. Mm -hmm. To earn this credential, the students had one week to try to do as many kind acts as possible. The school counselor said, in terms of being a kindness certified school, this just puts to the forefront what's important to us and that we're choosing kindness every day in what we do. I think for the students it's important because it's easy to focus on what's going wrong or negative thoughts and we focus on concrete, specific, kind acts we are empowered to make positive choices in our lives. I think that's wonderful. Um, the, the next recognition is to Decatur Robotics. So this is not actually a DHS team, from what I understand, but it is, it is a uh, city team on which a number of uh, DHS high school students are participating, along with one of our board members. Um, but our team, uh, the Decatur Robotics team, 426 Global Dynamics, competed in the FRC Regional Qualifier in Dalton, Georgia. What is FRC? First Robotic Challenge, I believe. Thank you. Hopefully I got the acronym right. Uh, it's basically Varsity <coughs> Robotics. Varsity Robotics. They came in first of the 38 teams competing. So they'll move on to compete in the state championship in Emerson, Georgia, the first weekend in April. We wish them continued success and hope to see them compete at the world championship in Houston. That's terrific. Uh, one other um, uh, something that um, uh, Kim Jones uh, at DHS, the counselor at DHS has shared with us. Uh, she said, I am so proud of DHS class, class of 2019's very own Brianna Hunter. Did I pronounce that correctly? Uh, she is now officially a published author. Her book, Seconds in Eternity, has been published. She's in the top, Brianna is in the top 10% of her class, has been a full-time dual enrollment student for two years, and she walked into my office as a ninth grader and stated that she was writing a book and had a goal of being published before she graduated. And she did it. Awesome. So 
our kids are doing amazing things. The, the last thing I wanted to comment on is a political thing, um, which is Senate Bill 53, um, which is a bill that has already passed the Senate and House uh, in this session of the General Assembly. Um, and I just want us all to be aware of this bill. It's a very bad bill, which will essentially limit the city of Decatur and its ability ever to annex additional land. What the bill does is say that if there is any annexation, the boundaries of the school system will not grow with the city. In order to grow the school system boundaries, there would need to be a separate vote of all the voters in DeKalb County who would then need to approve the annexation uh, for, the, for the city schools of Decatur. At the same time, there's a provision of the bill that says even that's not an option unless the city of Decatur were to propose taking 2% of the total enrollment of the DeKalb County school system of 100,000 students. Um, so what this does in practice is mean that unless this bill is changed, uh, this, our boundaries will now be fixed by law. And that, that, you know, in terms of the, you know, whether the city of Decatur needs to annex additional property to balance its uh, tax digest and what those boundaries should be, that's one question that we need to have. But the idea that it just is arbitrarily fixed today and no matter what comes in terms of citification uh, and municipalization of the county, that we have no opportunity to expand our boundaries. I think it's just wrong. Um, this bill is now a reality. Like I said, it hasn't been signed by the governor, but it has passed both the House and the Senate. Um, th this is a response to the dispute between uh, DeKalb County and the city of Atlanta. It really has nothing to do with the city of Decatur. We got caught in the middle of this, but we got forgotten and, and, and we, we came out of this really bad. And so what we're gonna need to do going forward is work with our senators and our representatives to fix it. Because it's, it's just, it shouldn't happen and, and it, it needs to be changed and we're gonna, we're gonna need their help. And so this is something that I think we're gonna be hearing about more coming up. And I just wanted to, to bring it to everyone's attention. Um, and that's all I have for my comments. Would others like to add anything? I would add two quick things. One, on piggybacking on that note, I just noticed that we don't have a legislative update on the agenda tonight. I just noticed that as well. Yeah. And I don't want to put Courtney on the spot, but maybe during our, um, I don't know, future discussion, I don't know. I, I don't want to put you on the spot right now, but it would be, I would be, um, and if you want to do it over email later or something like that, I'd be interested in getting a Let's little bit of Let's plan on doing it that way. I, okay. I apologize. I don't know how that happened, okay. but we, we will get a, a memo out to the board with the update. Okay. Um, and then second, just because we're, th this was like a great list of um, shout outs and spotlights to yeah. lots of um, folks. So thanks for putting that together, Lewis. And since we're spotlighting Fave tonight and they've gotten a number of Shout outs. I just wanted to mention that I was fortunate enough to get to chaperone the trip to Tybee Island a couple of weeks ago, and that is just such a phenomenal trip. And since we have a couple of Fay folks here, I just wanted to take a moment to express my gratitude for all of the hard work that you guys do in executing that phenomenal trip for kids. I got to um, just see and experience all the great things that happen on that trip, but as um, someone who was a, a daughter to an eighth grade teacher who had to go to Washington DC every year growing up. I also fully appreciate the sacrifice that teachers and their families make when they have to go, when they have to leave their families and go on a trip for a few days. And I know that's asking a lot. And so I just wanted to express my gratitude because it really is a phenomenal trip that takes a lot of work and sacrifices from the staff. So thank you. Anybody else? Thank you, Lewis, for all the updates. Those those were really good. Um, I just wanted to um, address kind of um, what Mr. Davis and Ms. Brooks and then what you said, Lewis, and I think the working together and focusing on that is, is definitely where we need to come from. And I think sometimes it's forgotten that the issues that we're bringing to the table aren't new. And they've been happening in our life and our grandparents' lives and our parents' lives for a really long time. And so although we are 
in the right space and getting onto the right path um, and we're addressing it and we're talking about it and we're doing what we're supposed to be doing, it gets very frustrating and it gets frustrating for everybody involved. I know that there are times that if I'm speaking to somebody and they say something that seems totally ludicrous to me, that I have to take a second and breathe and speak from maybe educating them and, and showing them a different perspective versus just doing what I really might want to do or what I really want to say. And that's not always easy to do. And so sometimes if we're having these conversations and it seems that somebody is a little too hot or too defensive or too upset, we all just have to like take that minute to breathe and try to try to understand how or, or get from the perspective how would you be if this was something that you had to talk about for the last 40 years and nothing has ever happened. So I think that at the heart of it, for, for everybody involved, we all want the same thing. And it's not always going to feel easy and it's, we're not always going to agree on the way to do it. Um, but I think defensiveness comes from being feeling like you're being attacked. And that's not what's happening. It's the system, it's, 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 and that's what needs to be broken down. And so because we sit up here representing the system, it feels personal, but it's not. So we have to kind of breathe and understand where it's coming from, and that's the only way we're going to be able to keep working with each other. And it's, again, it's a dance sometimes, too. We're going to make some steps forward, and then we're going to take some steps back. And it, like you said, if it was easy and we could just do this in one year, it would have been done 40, 50 years ago. So I don't want us to be discouraged or, or take things personal when we're feeling like the heat is on us because I think it should be. It should continue to be on us and not us, Tasha White or Lewis, but us, this collective. The heat is supposed to be on us, right? And so sometimes when we're alone with our families, we can talk about the frustrations that we have and, and vent about how you know something made us feel. But this collective has not has not represented black children well. We know that, and it still isn't. So if we feel the anger, if we feel the frustration, if we feel like we're being disrespected, maybe we are, but that's okay. That's okay. We will get to a point where these meetings will, people will be coming and they will be bringing great reports. We're gonna get to that point. I believe that that we're gonna start seeing, hearing good stories about teachers and administrators and, and our black kids are gonna speak about great experiences. That's where I think all of our goal is. It's just really painful right now because it's not happening. It's not happening as fast as we want it to, I know. It's definitely not happening fast enough for our black parents. So we just kinda of have to, that's where the work is and it's gonna be constant. And again, that's why I appreciated what you're doing over at, the, at, at Renfro because my conversations with my children at the table, not Renfro, four or five, sorry. My conversations at the table with my kids are now being, are now being validated by conversations that you're having. Because before it wasn't. Jordan didn't get this at Decatur High. She had to hear it just from me, and then I had to keep supporting her every time she came in, and she was getting the opposite. And so now when my youngest goes to your school, she will be validated by the things that she's hearing at my table as well. And it's gonna be an ongoing conversation and anybody that rolls their eyes and thinks we don't need to talk about it anymore probably doesn't need to be part of this system anymore because it's not going anywhere. We're gonna keep talking about it, we're gonna keep working on it, and we're gonna keep tweaking it until, again, we have those great stories coming to us. And I do believe we are the right district to be able to do that. I do believe that. So. I want to apologize for myself if I've ever come off as being defensive um, because that is not my intention or my goal. Um, I think sometimes I feel like I'm here and you're there and I don't want to feel like that. I always felt like you all are my community and I'm your community and it doesn't always feel like that sitting up here. Um, and so if you've ever felt like I wasn't listening or I was being defensive or I'm not taking what you say to heart then I do apologize for that stance because that is not my intention. Um, and we will continue to work together and however we feel like that looks and however that needs to be tweaked, I'm available to, to talk about that. I appreciate that and I wanna say that when you say maybe it's okay, it's, it's not okay. Um, 
that you know we, we need to make sure that we have a sense of urgency and we all know that we're acting at a board level or a governance level a superintendent a CEO level a sense of urgency means something different here and how fast we can affect change than what you may expect but we can't lose the sense of urgency um, and when Lewis says we're going to continue to fail I want to make sure we're qualifying that that we're going to fail in the same way that a toddler becomes a toddler where they're falling and they continue to fall forward until the toddling becomes walking and until walking becomes running um, I, I want to say I'm, I'm, I hope that Black History Month will become a thing of the past because black history will be every month in history and not have to be qualified with a special month put aside for black history as if black history isn't part of all history um, and I'll apologize that uh, as a 40-something white male, I wear a set of blinders that I can never quite take off, and I will always be an imperfect ally, most likely, but I will always try to be a good ally, and so help me become a better ally as well. So, thank you. Well, thank you to everyone for your words, um, and as well, you know, I'm all in, and I, wanted to bring something full circle just with what Lewis started talking about, what I saw, what I see at FAVE, what I see at Renfro, what I've seen at our other schools, and and how the extra activities that we do now with the groups that we're starting to have a dialogue within our school, but also including the sports that our kids get to do together, the musical groups that they get to be in with chorus and orchestra and band and the clubs and the robotics and the things like that I feel like they are so important and that as part of our equity work we are looking at how we can make accessibility to all of these groups for all of our students because I feel like that's where our children will, will build their re lasting relationships more so than just in the in the classroom while that's a priority of ours obviously academics if we want to work on building our culture and develop these relationships between our students, we can continue to focus on having balanced participation in all of these wonderful activities that we have available to our, to our students. I hope it's clear that when I said we'd continue to fail. I just wanted to make sure it was clear to everybody. I knew what you meant. <laughs> I mean, if you, if you, you are not going to succeed unless you are willing to fail. Right. And if you are not willing to make a mistake, you're not going to have the conversation, and we're not going to make any progress. That's all that I meant. I knew that. I, knew I that. think he knew that, too. I knew that. You knew that. Not everybody understands. <laughs> okay. That's true, too. Um, I'm going to dip in here. <clears throat> I think we're on to our consent items. Yes. Uh, so do we have a motion to approve uh, Romanet I, the personnel report? Uh, what is it, Romanet two, the school nutrition report, three, the financial reports, and four, the fiscal year 2020 tuition rate? I have a question about the tuition rate. We'll need to pull it then to talk about it. Can I just ask a question before we like make a motion? <laughs> If there's no objection, really we could dispense with the normal order. Can we dispense yes, with the normal order? Just ask your question. There we go. Right. <laughs> the, uh, the, the tuition includes uh, tuition for non-resident uh, people at, um, for the pre-K. And at first I thought, well, why are non-residents using the pre-K? And then I thought, well, maybe the answer is that if you're a, an employee with the benefit so that you get tuition for K through 12, you're also allowed to use pre-K, but just like everybody else, you have to pay tuition to it. Is that what's happening? I don't know the answer to that. Do you guys know what non-residents would be paying pre-K tuition? I didn't think any non-residents qualified for the lottery. Okay. Other than courtesy tuition, right? Well, there wouldn't be courtesy. Courtesy would be courtesy. There wouldn't be no, a wouldn't tuition. Be a charge. No, but courtesy tuition meaning we allow the teachers' children to come to our schools if they don't live in Decatur, but the, and that extends to pre-K without having they don't Would pay, that, they yeah. don't get to go to pre-K. They do. I thought they did. And if yeah. they go, if they can access pre-K, do they then have to pay tuition? They don't. 
Okay. So why do we have that on the form? I just pose that as a question. We can approve all of this, but the form includes reference to pre-K. Pre I don't, you'll have to tell me where you're talking about because I don't see it here. Go first down. Page of the form. I think so. There it is. Under tuition, annual tuition cost. Yeah, but where does it say for non-resident? Here you go. Check this out. It, we're, we're talking about non-resident tuition. It's all non-residents. Yeah, it's all non-resident tuition. Yeah, there's a 2019-2020 non-resident student tuition contract. Oh, okay. We'll check that. I just pose it as a question if y'all would check it. Yeah, we'll check that. Right. Um I don't think that changes what we need to pass in terms of no. the yeah. correct what you're actually and actually the recommendation is approval to set the k-12 tuition rate to 4590 okay all right so then yeah okay do we have the motion to approve the consent items so moved seconded Second. all in favor aye, aye. chair votes aye so uh, the, the motion carries okay um next on the agenda is the discussion item uh no, it's the information report for the Charlie Street Upper Elementary School update. All right, Billy. Good evening. Good evening. I'm Billy Heaton, principal of Tally Street uh, Upper Elementary School. First, I want to acknowledge all the amazing work going on over at Fave. It made me feel a little bit pressure. <laughs> <laughs> but I look forward to working with Principal Newton to make sure that this great work continues over at, at Tally Street. So I have a brief update for you guys tonight. Switch on the side. Okay. Okay. There we go. Um, First slide is actually dealing with a topic that Dr. Duty brought up um, a, f a little bit earlier, and I want to acknowledge uh, the superintendent and our HR department for moving up our job fair or our hiring season. Uh, it really has allowed us to get some top-notch uh, candidates, so I'm really excited about the teachers that will be coming over from Tally. You can see the breakout. Um, Tally's faculty is almost um, complete. We still have a Spanish nurse AA Title I parent liaison position to fill. Uh, but other than that, we are fully staffed. You can see the breakdown of the different schools where our staff will come from. We've got 10 uh, teachers and staff coming from Claremont, five from Glenwood, one from Oakhurst, four for, uh, from Westchester, six for uh, Winona Park. 31 for FAVE, and then one from um, Renfro Middle School. So you, you do see that the schools that are going to be Tally's feeder schools, we do have a little bit more um, faculty and staff from those particular schools because they had stated that they wanted to follow their kids. So I thought that was great. Uh, we have seven new teachers coming uh, from outside of the district. They're coming from DeKalb, Fulton, um, Gwinnett. We have um, a current instructional coach from Washington, D.C. that's actually coming down to be in the classroom here, and she actually is leading the equity work um, in her school district up in D.C., so that was a great hire. Um, two of the seven have, are current teachers of the year at, their, at the school that they're at, and then two of the um, seven are also their current PBIS coaches. So I'm um, excited about that with, uh, with the work that, that we've got coming ahead. Oh, I think this is me. Okay. okay. Exciting time. We're down to our top five mascots. Uh, we've gone through a, a very thorough process to get to the top five. five. We, we started off with just an open survey um, for all of our students, faculty uh, that will be at Tally next year and parents. And the top five in no particular order are the Turtles, the Blue Jays, Dragons, Titans, and Tigers. So the survey will close tomorrow and, um, and we're trying to find a creative, fun way to re reveal the mascot on the um, website. 
one of the things that I am keeping my fingers crossed, but the last time I looked at the surveys, in all groups, the same mascot is number one. So that will make it very easy to choose the mascot if, if that continues. So I'm, I'm hoping by in the morning it stays the same. Uh, just a few additional updates. Our SLT have, uh, has had two meetings and we're currently in the process of uh, drafting um, our vision and uh, mission statements. Um, we voted the other night at our SLT meeting to open up Tally Street as a school that will have a PTO instead of a PTA. PTA. Um, we had some good conversations about why we will want to do that. Um, we've had some great support, uh, and I think it just speaks well to the community. We've had some great support from parents from FAVE who will not even have students that will be at Tally Street who are coming to some of our meetings and giving input because they just want the school to open up uh, successfully. So that's that's been great. May I interrupt you? Sure. I've never understood the difference. Can you tell me? PTA is a parent teacher association and it's a national organization. And so you have to pay to be a part of the PTA. Um, and so they take some of your funds where a PTO, you do not have to pay to a national organization. And so th what we're hearing uh, from some of the current PTAs is the cost benefit an, uh, analysis that, that they've done. They do not see a huge benefit of being a PTA. And so, uh, and, and it made sense because FAVE is currently a PTO and so Tally opening up as a PTO made sense as well. Um, a little bit of update on IB. I attend my first IB training uh, March, the weekend of March 22nd. And so that will allow us to start the authorization process for um, Tally Street to become an IB candidacy school. Uh, the timeline was too tight uh, to make the April 1 uh, deadline with my training being at the very end of March. So that will mean we will apply in October and then we will become a candidacy school in the spring of next school year. Typically, it's a two to three year process to become an official IB World School. So um, that's the timeline that, that, that we're looking at. But I'm excited to find um, out more about IB. <clears throat> Just some. Uh, pictures. This is always the fun part. These were pictures that I uh, took yesterday when I was walking around on the site. That is a view of where the car rider line will come through and uh, the two buildings on the left is the cafeteria and the gymnasium. Um, you can see where a lot of the scaffolding uh, is up right there. That is one of the entrances to the school and then that is a classroom building that still has the purple um, stuff on it. That, that is a building B. There's another view of it, the scaffolding. Uh, they're doing a lot of brickwork over there. It, it was great yesterday, and then it rained, and all of a sudden it was it was muddy again. But uh, th they are bringing these big, huge hoses out there now, and actually um, wiping down the drive, so it's getting a little better. This is in Building B, which is the one that you saw that still has the same um, insulation on the outside. This um, particular building is not as complete as building A, and you'll see some pictures from uh, building A here in just, just a minute. But you can tell even in um, the building that it's not as far along, we're making some really good progress. This is a, a view of the grand staircase that uh, you'll see from both sides when you come in. It's gonna be really, really nice. Uh, this uh, is in the uh, admin office. This is coming down the hall, um, leaving the principal's office, heading down towards uh, the um, area where I would be able to access the gymnasium and the cafeteria. So you can see the sheet rock is already going up, so that's always a great sign. Uh, this is building A, so this is the one that's more uh, is farther along, and you can tell that um, the sheet rock's going up in the hallways and, and the classrooms. And I'm just so excited about this space right here. It's going to really allow for good uh, flow of students from the uh, gym and the, and the cafeterias going back to their classrooms because it's a really large space right there. So I've been very impressed with the, the width of the halls. Um, there is um, just a view of a classroom, and um, this is unique, and so they'll have blinds that we'll be able to shut during lockdowns and things like that, so it's a, a great safety issue or feature that we'll have at Tally. This is a classroom, and that is a massive amount of space for a classroom. I've never seen uh, such big, big classrooms in, in all my schools, including my one year in middle school. These are just very impressive. And another thing that's great is each of the classrooms will have a sink within their classroom. And so that's gonna hopefully really help us uh, cut down on germs and things like that during fl flu season. This is a picture of our cafeteria. 
uh, the painting has already started uh, happening in there. So you can see the bright green. Uh, the other side is, is yellow. You can see the kitchen equipment is already starting to go in and um, the freezer is right there um, back to the left near the ladder. And so um, it's really starting to look like a working kitchen for sure. This is the stage area in the gymnasium. And so they just painted this within the last couple of days. So you can tell how bright and um, cheery it's gonna be for our, for our kids. Uh, this is a view of the terrace level that um, this is Tally Street that you see right in front. So uh, this is accessed off of our art STEM room and also one of our classrooms. So we'll be able to utilize outdoor space uh, even inside of the building. And then last, uh, this will be the um, front entrance from Tally Street. And you can uh, get an idea about how it's a two story, um, two -story uh, entrance. It's going to be really, really nice. And so that's the, that's the latest. So they are, they're really, they're working hard out there and they're really making some good, good progress. So I want to thank Noel and his department because they're, they're really working hard. Great. Thank you. Great. And are we on schedule? My, uh, my dad was a contractor and if I uh, would have to bet, I would say absolutely. I, I can't. <laughs> Noel? I'll let Noel. <laughs> <laughs> Cool. And they're there all time, all the time. I'm a, I'll go over there even on the weekends, and they have people working. So, when you're a contractor and you start looking at liquidated damages, if you don't make time timelines, I think that they really start making sure that it's going to open on time. So, I have no doubt. Then we're done with the boundaries, right? So, mm -hmm. yes. Mm -hmm. Chandler, Chandler Street's not going to be going to Tally Street. <laughs> I know. <laughs> so, right? One of the things that we are, <laughs> one of the things that we are doing, I'm working with uh, Courtney to make sure we're sending out a letter to um, to each Tally resident that matches our, what we say as a street address for Tally versus uh, what they may or may not think. And so uh, the letter clearly says, if you are receiving this letter, you are zoned for Tally Street. And if, if that's not what you thought, then you know contact me and we'll we'll try to work it out. So those are going to go out in the next couple of weeks. <laughs> Thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank and you. I just want to, first of all, thank you for the update. Thank Noel for your work on this. And I think it's appropriate to mention, since Mrs. Newton is here, that I also appreciate all the collaboration between your two schools because I think it is a big challenge for us to make sure that we can duplicate all of the wonderful programming and opportunities the kids currently have at FAVE because that school is established. And it's a big challenge for you Mr. Heaton to to do that on day one and really get as much of that up and running as possible so we really appreciate your collaboration I can also appreciate that perhaps Mrs. Newton is getting some ideas for for new paint colors and things <laughs> but um you know from a from a community standpoint I think all of us on the board can appreciate also how important it is that the perception that these two schools create equal opportunities for all of our families and students is very important and also for the staff to feel that way <clears throat> as well and so thank you for your work and working together to make that happen and let us know what we can do if anything to help with that i might add that that i also appreciate your putting together the provisional slt or transitional i'm not sure what you're calling it but i appreciate that effort and i'm, I'm hearing really good things um, it just, it all sounds very good. So nothing but compliments. Okay, should we move to our action items? Mm -hmm. um, our first action item is the board policy manual. Could you explain what's before us, David? Yes, yeah, so this is version 1.3.2. Um, you never saw version 1.3.1 because it was an interim version we were working on internally, so you didn't miss out on anything. The red line document that's attached to there shows the <coughs> changes from the version that you approved last to this version that's in front of you today. So um, those changes are highlighted in the red line. Um, 
mostly or all of them are changes that we just need to make in order to capture a couple things that are in old board policy um, that we felt couldn't just be done with an administrative regulation. There had to be a hook somewhere in the board policy um, to hook it into. Um, so it's things like policy 2.5, safety security. We added, remember, we had reserved that section, and so we added in a statement there because there were several things we needed to hook some um, admin regs to. Um, there's just a couple things at the end of each um, section that were just, as we were reviewing the old board policies, we felt there was a need to add in um, something in each one of those in order to make a spot and then a change of title as we started using section 2.8 it really made more sense to call it finances instead of budgets um, and so um, those are what the changes are we're trying to also keep the um, the appendix updated so those links are getting updated as we go I have noticed that um, because of the way word creates red lines it doesn't look inside fields and so like the table of contents changed but it's not redlined um some of the hyperlinks changed but they're not redlined so just be aware it those are really it's not any meaningful changes but if you're curious about like why didn't the page numbers get redlined that's why because they're fields and so that's just an artifact of how word does the red line so but anything meaningful that changed is is represented in red line in the document so for what it's worth it usually does redline the fields yeah it doesn't on it's our a version frustration. yeah i prefer it this way yeah um and then the um the other piece of this action item is all a, there's a whole bunch of policies again like last time um, those old descriptor code style policies with the letters that um, we can now rescind because we have replacements in this manual um, or in admin regs um, and so we are working our way this will be a huge chunk of the rest of those policies um, it may even be by next month that we'll be able to have completely eliminated all those um, the old policies we are working with um, council on these to try to make sure there are some that are just a little more complicated um, and it, it's kind of beyond our expertise as to exactly what the wording needs to be and where it needs to say. So we're working on those a little bit um, slower um, to make sure we capture them correctly. But um, so the action item here is to approve this 1.3.2 version of the manual and to rescind those board policies that are listed there. Okay. Okay. Discuss oh, so do we need a motion first. Do we have a motion? Do we have a second? Second. second. Discussion. Do you want to state the, the motion? Just David, the recommendation is to approve board policy manual version 1.3.2 and rescind the board policies listed in the summary section of that agenda item. So moved. And seconded. Second. Discussion. Um, I want to thank you. This is great to see the number of to be determined and uh, the new uh, administrative regulations. It's all the end of the tunnel is in sight. It's very close. Um, one possibility that I might suggest is that we keep those descriptors in some link, um, whether we keep the appendix or not, just so that when we do those legal reviews, that it's easy for the people doing the legal reviews to find out where in our manual to find the codes that they're used to looking for. Um, but I'm very excited and uh, we're getting very close. Thank you. I agree. Thank you. Thank you. I had <clears throat> Well, I really appreciated that work too, um, and I really—it's it, really great to see. You know, you, we put something forward, but you guys have really sort of taken the laboring or in a big way uh, to, to to clean this up and get it over the finish line. So thanks to you, and thanks to, to everybody. I don't know who all's they're, afflicted, they're all working but, on it, but, but, <laughs> I, but I, I appreciate uh, that it's being that it's being done really in the spirit, in which it, it's great. Mm -hmm. So thank you. I have some other comments about the policy. We can go ahead and vote on the policy, but then I have a comment or two that I wanted to make. Um, um, so should we go ahead and vote? All in favor? Are your comments going to change our... No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's not, it has nothing to do with Is this a strategic this. sequencing? <laughs> <laughs> like you that. can move to All reconsider. Right. <laughs> All right, so the chair votes aye, so that motion carries. <clears throat> I had <clears throat> one comment was that, and this is really because I forgot to mention it on the consent items, but the... There's a personnel report, and the personnel report has the equity connection and the equity impact and the board policy connection. Mm -hmm. 
when it states the board policy con connection, it's citing the administrative regulation instead of the policy. Oh, okay. I would appreciate seeing both because no, because I'm looking and I'm I'm going back and trying to chase it down. Yes. So, so I don't have to go back and turn back and find out what the policy said. Let's put the policy then the. Yep, the I agree. Um, <clears throat> the. Um, well, that was a small thing. The other thing was that in the, the uh, thing about the tuition made me go back and look at the book and say, well, exactly where is the Early Childhood Learning Center? Mm -hmm. And you know, how, how do you have authorized authorization even to do this, mm -hmm. Mr. Superintendent? Um, mm -hmm. There's no policy that 4.1D, operate, operate, operate the school district. Operate the school district. Look at how quickly he knew that one. That's, <laughs> that's the one I have to turn to a lot. It's your favorite one, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But I think we need we need to have a, we need to, that's a gap that we need to fill, and, and, and particularly because we have some particular uh, preferences in regard to the importance right. of ECLC, and so we don't want this to be uh, an, an item that, that that slips. So, for the future agenda, we need that policy. Um, and while we're at I don't it, if you saw yet, I did recommend a possible change to capture that through email. email I don't know if you've seen that yet, seen but um, if you can take a look at that sometime and. Good. I think that's all I wanted to mention. Oh, and the other thing is that if, if we could sit down in, in Courtney and look through the website, and a lot of times it's user error. We've but, come up with a new plan, actually. What we're going to do is create a page that every link that references either board policy or administrative regulation goes to a page that explains to people, here's what board policy is, here's what administrative regulation is, and then you jump off from that to the individual pages, just okay. so that folks have kind of a learning opportunity of here's how all this all connects. And That's so good. we'll have quick links and we'll put it anywhere there's any connection to it, like offices, superintendent, board pages, whatever. There'll be a link that says board policy and administrative regulations. It'll all go to a common page so you can learn what the difference is and then from there you go to the Sounds other ones. So. That sounds great. I, I st it still might make sense to show, so I can show you the kind of errors I make. Perfect. So that, so that you can, you know, Set the page great. up we'll, for idiots we'll, like myself. We'll set up a whole study, I think. It'll yeah. be great. Yeah. <laughs> that just made me think of a, an email I sent, David, and you may have seen it. Just the overall, there was one link to a previous policy that no longer existed and it was broken. Are we doing a an overview of the website to catch all of those and we will. A lot of it is because we're rescinding all those policies in the assembly system mm -hmm. um, that um, once those are rescinded, we will go through and find all those links that may have broken that need to go someplace else. Okay. Okay. Our next action item <clears throat> is um, uh, recommended approval of RFP number 19-B001. I suppose we should let... Uh, and Heather, tell us about this one. Sure. Um, well, Dr. Duty and Garrett and I just met last week to review the proposals that we had received, and you unanimously agreed that the proposal from Georgia State University was the one that we felt would best answer our RFP. Um, but we did have some comments, and so uh, Dr. Duty is going to take those comments back to GSU and negotiate those further into the contract. And I do have that meeting set up with them, by the way. So what does that mean for what we're doing right now? So what, what you're doing is uh, authorizing me to negotiate a contract with them based on that RFP. And so okay. I would negotiate that contract along with the feedback from the RFP committee. Okay. okay. Do we have a motion? So moved. So moved. Second. Discussion? Uh, all in favor? Aye. 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 Chair votes ayes. Motion carries. Um, I want to thank you guys, as we've done before, but this is a, it was a really strong RFP, and we got, a, I thought, a really strong response. I really mm -hmm. thought that it was good. So thank thanks you. for all the, and I know it was a lot of work to get it all done. Thanks. Still more work to do? Yeah, this yeah, is just the beginning. All right. <laughs> the last item is we have to decide whether we. <laughs> <laughs> Want to endorse Garrett? Get <laughs> Garrett, can you can you read the motion for us, please? Um, I think the I didn't write it down. Uh, move to confirm 
Garrett Goble representing City Schools of Decatur Board of Education at the G GSBA Governmental Operations Committee meeting. Okay. Should we move to appoint Garrett, our representative to the GSBA? Can we do an executive session on it first? Talk yeah, about we might need to. Can I vote no? Because <laughs> it also means I have to go to Savannah in the summer. So. Okay. Um, so, so we have a motion? Second. Okay. Discussion? Thank, Thank you for you. being willing Thank to you. do it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Favor? You do a great job. Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. Um, I suppose Our, the only comment would be for Courtney to, if you have your prepared stuff for the positions, um, if there's anything that, that we have that isn't in um, the GSBA position pamphlet, that whole thing, um, just so that if that discussion comes up that I can make sure that I'm representing our collective position. You know, and I didn't say anything during my chair comments, but it seems like I had at one time thought that I should to just mention that we're... I think we're all going to the NSBA conference, aren't we? Are we all going I'm, up there? I am not. You're not? I'm not. not able to go. Well, four of us are, right? Mm -hmm. David Wickham. But, um, oh, no, David's not going. So David's not going, so the four. David and Neil and Heather? And Garrett. So the four of us. Sorry, Garrett, okay. okay. I just thought that we should mention that we're doing this. Um, and mm -hmm. far from being a boondoggle, uh, <laughs> this is not something I'm excited about doing. I'm excited about being with you guys. <laughs> Don't get me wrong. <laughs> but look, I'm going to be. Boy, you're I'm selling gonna be, it. <laughs> I'm going to be out of town. It's a for, good experience, but I'm, it's a th big thing. This commitment. fits right in between two weeks of travel. And so then I'm, I'm going to be in. Uh, yes. Well, it's a, it's it's a big thing. It is definitely a sacrifice for everyone to get away from work and family. Yeah. So. I was really trying to get some sympathy. But I'm looking forward to it. I think that the, uh, the right. opportunity is Let's move on to our discussion items. Mm -hmm. um, Board this is our first ever monitoring report. This is the uh, process that we've enacted with the new policy manual where we, um, the board provides broad direction, the superintendent interprets and implements and then reports back to tell us how they've interpreted it and what progress we're making. So uh, let's, let's hear from Daryl. Can yeah. I give a little intro, a little, Please just do. expound a little bit on what you were sharing. Um, so yeah, this is a big piece of the policy monitoring or the policy um, governance process we've gone through and this is the crux of it, right? This is what's about to happen is how policy governance works. Um, and so um, I wanna go through quickly the email I sent earlier today just to remind the board of, and let others know like what they're about to see and kind of how this process goes. Um, and then also, um, just to give people an overview of what to expect. So um, we um, create a, we have the board policy monitoring calendar that's attached to this agenda item and it, we also discussed it at previous meetings. And that basically tells ev when every single board policy in sections one, two, and four are going to be monitored. Um, and so when will a report be coming about that? And so like Lewis was saying, the process is the board policy statements are often rather brief. And then what we do is we interpret that policy statement based on what we've heard in the board meetings, the discussion, the community responses, and what the board has written in their policy. Um, and then we um, put together statements on whether or not we feel like we're meeting that policy. Um, depending on an ENDS policy or an executive limitation, the statements look slightly different, but you'll see those on the, on the reports. Um, and so we basically um, do the interpretation, take a position and provide evidence for our position. And that's what these reports will look like. And we looked at a template last time um, regarding that. And um, Daryl will be the first one to share an actual report that way. So what happens is we put this report on the agenda, board members look at it in advance. Um, so we don't do a presentation when we come to the board meeting um, because you've already reviewed the report. We can jump right into the discussion. Um, whoever writes the report, Daryl in this case, will be available to answer whatever questions you might have. Um, things for clarification. One of the things that you'll want to do first is select which board member is going to be drafting the board response to the monitoring report because of the absolutely critical part of this is the administration submits a report and then the board basically submits a report back to the administration. Um, and so I shared that template earlier today and we discussed that at the last board meeting as well. But the idea being you're giving feedback of one, do you agree with what we thought we um, 
our statement of, uh, of compliance of are we um, making progress, are we not making progress, is it sufficient, et cetera. Um, another one is um, just your feedback on the report in general. Did the format work? Did the, do, do you want to see something different next time this policy is monitored? Um, was it the appropriate data? Were the graphics helpful? Like things about the report more substantive things about your feelings regarding um, the content of the report. And then also sometimes coming out of this, there will be recommendations to update the policy manual. And so that would also be present in the board's response. And so whoever is selected to draft that will listen to this discussion tonight and they will draft a response um, to the, the monitoring report. Um, and then that won't become the official response until the following board meeting. So every time we have a monitoring report, the next month you'll see the board response to the monitoring report. And in between is when that person will draft, share it with the board. I assume they'll get feedback from other board members and whatnot. So when we get to that next meeting, you can then vote to approve that. And the reason this process is so important is because then this is the formal way of telling the administration, here's, here's where we agree, you're spot on, here's where we think you need to improve, here's things where we think you misinterpreted what our sentence was in our policy manual, or maybe we just realized we should have provided more clarification. And so then we use that response to recommend changes or to put new administrative regulations in place. And one of the nice things about all of these being written reports is then when it comes back to do this monitoring again in the future, we have something to refer to to remind us all what happened last time we monitored this? What did we say we wanted to see happen between now and then and, and things like that? So that's kind of the process. Um, and that's just a process that we created internally. So if we want to change it at any time, we can. Um, but for now, that's the process we've been discussing. So any questions about that or where it all fits in? All right, now we're ready to actually jump into the report. <laughs> So, I, so it sounds like you are not going to report, but you're going to feel you're Correct. He's to ready to answer questions. questions. Correct. So we have no process. We just, whoever wants to jump in. I have a comment that I've already shared by email. Should I share it? Yep. <clears throat> my, my first comment is that, uh, well, first, um, I appreciated the format and the content of the monitoring report. Mm -hmm. I thought that it was very useful and I think that it was a good sort of a um, trial because <clears throat> I see a lot of value in this. I think I like it. Um, one of the things that it did and one of the reasons that I think it's good is that it, it sort of puts on paper how you interpret the policy uh, and it surfaces the fact that I interpreted our ends statement differently than you all have interpreted it, mm -hmm. which is one of the functions of the monitoring That's right. report. Um, the policy is that uh, an end goal under academics and foundations is that students will demonstrate an understanding of and respect for human and intercultural differences in multiple perspectives. Um, and understand that this is one of eight or one of 12 end goals that sum up essentially all of our academic aspirations for the students and so you know, this is where we address curriculum um, I mean it doesn't have to be the only place but this is the principal place where we say a student has you know the end goal is for students to be able to do these 12 things and so that one uh, number seven, demonstrate an understanding of and respect for human and intercultural differences in multiple perspectives, I see as a very broad topic that includes a lot. Um, the report addresses, I think, an important aspect of that very broad topic that has to do with really racial equity and how students feel they're being treated, and whether, whether teachers are treating black and white students equally. Um, all of those are extremely important, as we've talked about but they do not go to the breadth of the subject, of the subject matter, which I have no doubt that we're doing, but you know, where we address this, in my opinion, is through almost everything they do in the IB curriculum, which stresses understanding multi, you know, human and intercultural differences in multiple, multiple perspectives. You know, um, you know, our students need to read books and literature so that they understand about other people, 
Um, they need to study history, African American history, European history, Indo, you know, Indian history, you know, world history. Um, all of those things are what we're shooting for is that we have a broad understanding of different peoples and cultures and and et cetera. Um, so I, th I think that we need, uh, in my opinion, uh, those things are all very important and they need somehow to be reflected. I think that they are reflected in this number seven, but the way it's interpreted in the report is much narrower. Okay. It has nothing to do with the content of the report as it is, except for that. Yeah, no, scope. that's helpful. Do other board members agree? You know, I, I hear what you're saying, and I understand the um, the need. And I think you know, in policy governance, you start broad, and so I think it's a natural thing that if we um, can come up with those collective ideas that you know are those uh, better guidance on goals, then we should add those. Um, I, I guess what, where I would come from is in this initial report, um, the fact that our number one priority is equity in the school district, to me it seems reasonable that given the surveys which are available and for which we have three years of data, that this would be a good place to start. Um, I think we can add on to that, and that may be part of our board guidance and to providing guidance for how we set the goals and what we want to see in future reports. I don't have a problem with contents of the report. I don't have a problem with starting with this piece. I do have a problem if we don't think that we have a current goal that would require our students to read history, read literature, or understand different cultural perspectives other than black and white. I think that that would be an un irresponsibly narrow, mm -hmm. and that's not what anybody means. And so it's, it's uh, we're on the same page, I think. Mm -hmm. um, it's just that, I, you know, we don't have any other statement that those things are important except for right there. And just to clarify, too, um, as we go through the process, there's times where we'll feel we need to update the policy itself based on a conversation like this. And there's other times where, especially early on, we may feel like this was the first report. And so the feedback from the board may be you've got to go into more detail or more depth in the next report, right? So um, if, we have, if we have a feeling that the statement itself is probably stands on its own, but it just needs to be interpreted more broadly, that can just be the feedback and we can make sure to incorporate that into our interpretation. Does that make sense? That makes total sense. The only, the only thing that I would say is, catch, strikes me as incorrect, right. Right, which is a hard word, but, but uh, you know, what the heck. On page three where it's, it lists w what we're going to do to address the results of the survey, that mm -hmm. clearly we're not doing a good enough job treating uh, and, uh, people with cultural humility, um, et cetera. And we have three bullets for action items, which have to do with culturally responsive teaching. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then it says that if we do the above, then students will demonstrate an understanding of and respect for, et cetera, suggesting that those three bullets will satisfy the policy. Gotcha. That's, I, that's where I actually disagree. If you were to take that sentence out and say that this is an aspect of it, but not the whole thing. Then I, because I, that makes it sound like that's all that's needed, and once you've done it, you're done. Yes, We're gotcha. sympathizing. Okay, that's right. Okay. That's helpful. I might be off track here, but you know, I think to begin with, I'll say that I think this is important information, and to, you know, as Garrett was saying, this is one of our priorities, and we have the data. It's important to look at it. So, I think this is a very important report to look at. However, I can see Lewis's point, and I, and I'm I'm looking at our policies, and I'm wondering if this doesn't also strongly relate to policy 1.4, which is character which is self-awareness and also social awareness. So and there may be overlap. Right. Um, so and it's quite possible that in a given policy monitoring report in the future for a different area, mm -hmm. we may even refer back to some of the same data because mm -hmm. there will be overlap between some of the different policies when they're monitored. Mm -hmm. So what we do is like, so this is the monitoring report for 1.27, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the only thing, even when there's other there may be other connections to other policies. That's We don't go into that because that will be addressed when we get to that policy. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yes, and so remind me about the process of how, you know, how did it come about that this was decided to be the report for policy 1.2B7? So and How did we get to this? 
report like from why that. this one yeah yeah so what we did is we listed out if you look, open up that calendar or maybe in your packet mm -hmm. we listed on every single board policy mm -hmm. and then we brainstormed as an administrative team are there certain times that certain things should happen right so are there things things that need to come together um, because they're all related and it should be one like at the same meeting we're monitoring all those policies at the same time are there other things that because of when the data is available it makes sense to have that monitoring in a certain month or mm -hmm. things like that and then the vast majority can be monitored anytime right it's just a matter of how recent your data is that you have available to look at and so we came up with that calendar based on that right. and we tried to balance it out over the 12 months of all, if, so that every policy was monitored at some point and this one just happened to fall where in on the March okay. month and so that's the one that that came okay so that wasn't my question I'm sorry oh, okay my question was how was how how did we come to this like this data and it's very detailed mm -hmm. and it was a lot of work clearly but how did we come to connecting that so with board policy anytime you're monitoring one of the ends policies um, part of the process is coming up with how is it going to be measured. Mm -hmm. And so we went through and created the interpretation. So you start with the interpretation of what does this policy mean to us? Mm -hmm. And then we look at what evidence do we have that can lead us to a conclusion about that mm -hmm. interpretation. And so that led us to these data. And so that's why these data were picked because we felt like they were the data available to us mm -hmm. that we could use to monitor that interpretation. Okay. Does that clarify that? Yes, it does. And so I'm just asking the question because you know, if, if we get to this point where there's been a tremendous amount of work done at a great level of detail, and then we find that the board thinks that, oh, that wasn't maybe the intent of that policy, should we maybe have a work session or something where we review maybe the upcoming quarter's policies, since we're doing this for the first time, and say, you know, here's what we think we are proposing for the type of report that might support uh, whether or not we are or support our monitoring of this policy. Like maybe we should have a get where you're going. preliminary conversation. I would conversation. recommend we try to kind of do it this way because okay. we're barely keeping our head above water as it is. Okay. And so um, I would rather have folks put their time into doing the best monitoring they can okay. um, without kind of muddying the waters of having to think ahead of how it might be monitored to then strategize of what it looks like. It, these will not be perfect. And we want like... You may get a report and you say, wow, you totally missed the mark, right? None of these data are meaningful to what we were wanting, and we're okay with that. Mm -hmm. Like, that's acceptable. Okay. <laughs> um, well, then if, if so that's okay, that's, that's fine. I just wanted to bring it up because I wouldn't, I wouldn't want anyone spending a, too much energy on something that in the end didn't support the policy. Hopefully that will be rare if that happens just because yeah. – okay. um, having professionals work on this, hopefully they understand pretty well what the best evidence is yeah. to monitor it with um, and what's available. Um, okay. But there may be times too where you'll say, this evidence was fine, but we really wish there was evidence that looked at A, B, and C, okay. right? So we would really like by the next time this comes up for you to try to determine a way that we can more closely measure those three things right. because it wasn't represented in the available data, that would be fine too, yeah. right? So and I'm it's, sorry we're it's having a this, give and take. This and is a conversation, a, like an overlapping conversation. I already warned Daryl that it would yeah, be Yeah, like so this that. isn't specific to your report, <laughs> but it's a new process for all of us. And, Correct. And so I just wanted to talk through the process. But we all know that these are going to, like the first year, and we were talking about this earlier, it's like a new job. Correct. You're learning what is expected at your new job. And so the whole first year as we go through these, I'm expecting it's going to be a learning opportunity. Absolutely. So That's exactly. Thank you, thank you for. If, if, I, if I can jump. Mm -hmm. so one, one, I mean, one, the good news is that all of the data is really important data. There's yes. no question but that it's a good survey, that it's important, and that we need to address the findings. The only question I have is whether it's policy 1.2 B7, or I would have probably put it in equity or you know, you can put any of them. Some of them will be used in more than one spot. Right. So it's not a question of so. whether it's useful. It is yep. useful. Mm -hmm. and, you know. and for what it's worth, <clears throat> what I would think of in terms of response to 1.2 B7 would probably start <clears throat> with a description that says, um, uh, well, I, I, I would give the understanding of it that I've already offered, which is that it, it has to do with the curriculum and, and, and 
such, but then I would have a discussion of how we satisfy that, and the, um, the IB curriculum emphasizes uh, an understanding of res and respect for human and intercultural differences, and it's emphasized throughout the curriculum in these ways. And likewise, the uh, uh, expeditionary learning curriculum for the lower grades has the same emphasis. And so it would just be a few statements before you move into the specific focus of this report mm -hmm. so that we're all comfortable that, yeah, yeah, we've got that covered. Gotcha. Right. Okay. So I guess we can focus on the report now. <laughs> Thank you. But I'm glad we had oh, that discussion. Good. This is what we need to talk about. Thank you. So I had a question about the next, next step section. Um, kind of piggybacking on, David, what you said earlier about the career fair and how um, how highly populated it was and we, we felt really good about it. And I was just wondering if this would be the section in the next steps or it might be another section where looking at the data we would say, okay, so the hiring and, and, and the questions that we ask, mm -hmm. um, I know that we were going to HBCUs, that was one thing that we were adding mm -hmm. to, to that process, but even just the type of teachers that we want that we feel like don't just check off the normal and usual boxes that we've had where they've had 10 years of experience and they have yeah. a master's, which is all great, but is there a component now in our interviewing process where we're really looking at teachers we feel will champion what we're trying to do so that, because a lot of these, the numbers that are low, for example, are um, teachers, teachers treating students fairly um, and teachers treating students with respect. And so it's real data, but it's disheartening to say the least. And so we do have this great opportunity now. We have a new school opening and all of these openings. And I'm just wondering if it, if it would be this section where we would need to see what we're doing differently in our hiring process and what we're asking for differently or what we're looking for differently. Is that, do you feel like that's where we Maybe definitely could. I think we didn't include it because we've already made the changes, and so okay. we are already approaching hiring differently. Mm -hmm. um, the vast majority of our staff are returning staff, mm -hmm. right? The vast majority. And so that's why you see next steps of like getting Working the Beyond Diversity training right. and stuff about those staff. Okay. Um, so that's just a, I mean, it, it would have been like a, not a next step, but a currently it's in process step, step, something okay. like that. Makes that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have a number of notes I've been writing down. Um, so some of the things I, I would like to see in a report like this, particularly when you have surveys, is participation rates. It looks like the participation rate was fairly high, but it's not really easy to see what was the percent at each one of those block levels. Um, it's fine. Sure, to be counted in CCRPI, it has to be at least 75%. So it's a minimum 75% for the report to come out, which is great. That's a very high participation rate. Um, of the total student body, is that? Of that grade level taking it, yes. Okay. Um, and we, we talked a little bit about this, David, earlier. Um, part of, of when we're not meeting the, how, how's the phrasing at the very top? Mm -hmm. um, not making reasonable progress. Not making reasonable case. progress. Mm -hmm then I think the board's attention is going to, to, to get into that gray area where we're looking at the actions and the next steps that are taken, mm -hmm. um, not so that we can be an extra cook in the kitchen, but so that we can have a reasonable um, confidence that the actions being taken will, and you, you talked about this as well, there are process steps, mm -hmm. I, I don't remember the right words, and then there are kind of results-oriented yeah. steps. Mm -hmm. And so from the board perspective, I realize this is the first report. This is the first use of this data. Most of the steps that are being put down there or process or building the capacity to address the issue. Um, my sense of urgency and perhaps my irrational exuberance um, is to uh, wonder where the results, can you, can you point us at when we can have the expectation of those results oriented actions. And when we get there, we're not there yet, um, I, I had talked about this in the feedback of the various ways that other school systems handle these types of reports. Um, for me, there, there's an there's importance in, in saying here's our anticipated implementation. Here's the anticipated 
budget, here's the anticipated effect size. Um, so that when we reach the end of that period and we're looking at the next report, we can compare what we plan to do because nothing, you know, withstands impact with reality. No, the best laid planned, reality happens, things change. Chance that you're going to implement things exactly the way you planned will be slightly different. Uh, the effect size may be larger or smaller. Um, and the budget, you, you know how those things go. Sometimes, you know, things change. I think it's amazing that you're being able to bring in uh, – PBIS coaches and people that have a lot, some of the hires were very strategic. Um, so I, I'm not saying this to address this report, but I'm saying looking towards the next cycle and the one after that, um, participation rates just making it really easy. Um, and then in response to the thing about um, historical black colleges and some of the changes that have already been made, there is that component of this that is a public facing report and I think it's really important for you not to miss the opportunity to list all the things that we've done and are doing um, just so that when, when people read this, they don't, you know, it takes a lot of moving parts and a lot of kind of strategic, um, maybe this is the wrong word, but hustling to, to get this type of organizational change to happen. Mm -hmm. So don't miss the opportunity to, to state those types of, of changes. Um, I think that covers the gamut of what I wanted to cover. Um, I do think that I'm trying to resist the temptation to shoehorn other policy-related goals into this report, and so I'll stop there. Okay. Um, just in general, Daryl, I think the, the most exciting thing about this report is the next steps, and so I am grateful for the thought that went into that because I think you know the data is great but what are we going to do with it is the most important thing and reflecting on where we've come and how what we are currently doing to change that I think is very important so thanks for your work to make that robust and, and thoughtful um, I have one question just about the data and just um, and what you you already answered Garrett's question about the response rate and I was curious whether or not you w might think this would be interesting <coughs> to know but do you think it would be interesting to know the percentage of black versus the percentage of white students? Like, what percentage of black students responded versus what percentage of white students responded? Even though we are saying, or you're saying that we have a 75% response rate of the total student body, do you think that that would be of interest? And should we monitor that in any way to make sure that we are, I guess, getting a representative number of each group that's somewhat balanced. So, so the way these surveys happen yeah. is they happen during class. And okay. so the chances of there being a difference is really a okay. very slim chance. If we don't, if, if we're not hitting 100%, it's because like an entire class wasn't able to go do okay. the survey. Okay. It's not like the kids are doing this on oh, their own okay. at home or something. Okay, it's not sent home, out in there. Okay, that <clears throat> helps. So, that, so then maybe it's not a factor we should be getting a representative yeah. of both groups. Okay, that's what I was curious about. Does the same survey, I assume the same survey addresses m many subjects other than what it is. Oh, yes. What it's is. very robust. Mm -hmm. does, does it ask questions? Um, that's going a little bit, <clears throat> there's a little bit of a rabbit hole maybe, but um, uh, such as I feel not just respected by my teacher, but I feel engaged every day. I'll have I to feel look. like there are hundreds of questions in the survey. I'll have to look. If you look up Georgia Student Health Survey, I think that's what it's called, right? I'm Georgia looking really survey. quickly. Oh, you've got it there. Mm -hmm. You can uh, you can look up all the questions um, and responses there too. There was a study. It was the Harvard School of Education put out a report a couple of years back now, <clears throat> but then they asked <clears throat> a number of questions along those lines. Um, do you feel engaged every day? Do you feel like that's the one that I remember. But okay. There are subjects like that. And basically the, the finding of the study is that you could, this is at a time when there's a lot of interest in um, standardized tests for value-added metrics for how well a teacher is doing. And what the study found is that positive responses to the question, do I feel engaged every day, was everybody's predictive and useful and valuable. Hmm. 
as these statistical differences and uh, value added on uh, standardized tests. Okay. And it seems like that is a question that we ought to be asking kids, right? And if everyone's feeling engaged and feeling like they're learning, we're probably doing a good job. And if not, they're not. So it's, so it's my understanding that if we, so if there are hundred, hundreds of questions, you just pulled out the ones that are relevant, relevant to this relevant policy. policy. Right. That's correct. So we might see another policy Absolutely. where there are more questions. Exactly. Okay. Well, exactly. It's okay. a very broad survey. Right. Okay. But All right. And the other thing we're trying to get, but running into some trouble, um, is state level data aggregated. We can pull up data for any district, but we can't get the aggregated data. So this was originally pulled together by. Um, uh, ARC, the Atlanta Regional Commission, did the work to pull this together. ARC. ARC. Um, and um, so I've reached out to the, our contacts there to see if we can get aggregated data because um, you can't get that for whatever reason. You can't get it with everyone together. So we're working on that as well. You know, some of the responses made me wonder, you know, there are certain trends, you know, when they're young and excited and then middle school and then they become, you know, puberty and teenagers. I wanted to know what does a you know, what does a high-performing similar school district look like so that we could separate out? Um, we want all students to have 70s and higher, um, but in the highest-performing school districts, what does it look like? Mm -hmm. uh, because it may still be that we see similar trends just based upon age and, and you know, I, I how teenagers act. I mean, trying to interpret the, the charts was extremely hard. I mean, it's not like it's self-evident what's going on. Well, you know, is that there's an issue, but you really don't have much idea what it is. Correlation and causation are right. hard to suss out. Well, and they're somewhat contradictory. You know, like all students feel <coughs> they're treated fairly. There's one set of responses, and then another says all students are feeling treated fairly regardless of race and other issues. You know, completely there's, different responses. There's a, my favorite part of this data, like, gets to the challenges with self-perception data, which is you'll see the chart in there that says, um, I am treated fairly by my peers, and it's not a very high percent. And then you see the chart of I treat my peers fairly, and Super it's almost 100%, yeah. right? Yeah. right? Yeah. Like it's the nature of self-reported yeah. data that you look at yourself differently than others. But mm -hmm. those, w as long as we know that going into it. Um, and is often intentional in survey design to ask a similar, to ask the same question in different ways to see if there's a discrepancy. Um, Mr. Jones, you asked about the engagement, and so I looked at, so the elementary survey questions, grades three through five, are a little different than the secondary questions, but uh, it, of the slice that I'm looking at in this moment, and there are many more questions, um, it asks, I like school, um, I feel like I do well in school, that's a close, those two might be a close approximation to Engagement and it asks something very similar for the secondary survey around I like school and I feel successful at school, but it doesn't ask directly around engage around about engagement. I think it's interesting, and this is again a little bit of field, but I think it's relevant because when I was looking through the policy manual, because I felt that this addressed uh, something other than the academic criterion that we'd set, I felt that this went to a different something that we all value but that doesn't land at 1.2 v7 and I thought well where would it land and I thought that we probably had <clears throat> either a goal or uh, an executive limitation that talked about sort of you know not only are we going to teach these academic skills and etc but we're also going to uh, make sure that every kid come, I mean, like in our mission statement that our kids are motivated that they feel motivated to come to school, that they're taught in an engaging manner. And that, so I started looking for wh what policy we have that refers to that, and I couldn't find it. Um, and, uh, but, but I think we should have one, because it's something that's important to us, and we're failing if we're not doing it. Yeah, I think sometimes those bigger things like that fall into the very big, broad ones of like vision and mission too, right? That means you can't forget that, that we, they do get monitored. How are we going to monitor vision? Well, wait do you see. You're just going to have to stay tuned. <laughs> <laughs> the vision and mission ones are really interesting ones mm -hmm. to monitor because they are so broad, right? But that is where you get into some of those. Um, I'm not saying we don't need 
a policy like what you're saying, but I do think it will get monitored at some level when we get to those. Okay. And what I also heard and appreciate about the in the column of it would be even better if for a future monitoring report was that it is, I heard that it's not either this or a direct focus on curriculum. I heard it as a focus on both. So I could see a future report continuing to report on this and also bring in Absolutely. the curricular pieces. And so in that way, I think it could, what you're talking about, if it could still get monitored, if it's not somewhere else, it could be monitored in this way uh, <coughs> around policy 1.2 B7, adding in the curricular pieces as well. Sure. Uh, I believe one of those curricular pieces, we already have a goal explicitly in the manual, if I recall, and that was uh, students becoming fluent in a second language. <laughs> Um, that's one that I would, you know, if you learn to think in another language, you learn another cultural perspective implicitly. Mm -hmm. So that, that's one that I could see showing up in both places, but I'm perfectly willing to wait mm -hmm. for that. You know, it's 1.2 one one to be 11. Yeah. Okay. So the, the other thing that was very clear in doing this um, board policy monitoring report and also having conversations with Dr. Duty and other members of cabinet and huge thank you to Heidi and Anthony who helped with the data collection, um, is that it, it's a little bit of an artificial division and because we really believe and live teaching to the whole child in our district. And so it's a little, art, that's why it's so easy to see a connection to character. And I reference that in the report uh, that a future character board policy monitoring report is coming because some of the things that we saw in here actually put a little bit of a spotlight on the need there. And so throughout, as Dr. Judy said, the policy monitoring report, there will be direct links to other things, or you'll see that they are very, very interconnected, which I think is the power of our ends policy. We're going to need a visual that's like the org chart that you did. <laughs> no problem. I love that. Uh, I like, I think the one you've done is good, very organic. Already good. So, but just as someone who just spent a lot of time with this data, can you just sum up for us your, your takeaway from it? For example, why you see some of the trends as being some of them were, were good while other ones showed challenges and if, if you have any thoughts on why those would be and that i would just appreciate your kind of perspective and summing that up yes so one of the things that jumped out is that in the when you look at secondary and you look at the civic social learning the last two statements that the students respond to uh, and the last two statements are around, I treat other students fairly and I am open towards different opinions and perspectives. Students feel very strongly that they are uh, meeting that. Um, what I found interesting was the disconnect between that and the perception of how they are treated themselves. And it's, so what's striking to me is how consistent it is from year to year, um, breaking it out in the two larger racial subgroups that we have, black and white. And so that to me spoke volumes because there wasn't a year that felt like an anomaly for some reason. It felt, unfortunately, that we could sort of predict if we were to cover up 17, 18, we could probably predict 17, 18 from looking at 20, 2016. Um, so th that was um, disheartening to see that it was so predictable, but it's also what we talk about when we will have eliminated the inequities we will not be able to predict achievement or discipline profile or a student's response to these questions by knowing the student's race or ethnicity. And we are able to do that with this. And so it uh, highlighted uh, the work that we're doing and the importance of the work that we're doing, which is part of why the interpretation is written the way that it's written. And so in the culturally responsive teaching, which EL education and IB very much lend themselves to culturally responsive teaching practices. That's one of the things that we have to make sure that our teachers are doing. And Dr. Huddleston is teaching an amazing course to some elementary uh, staff and secondary staff through CSD University. And of course, that's not the entire staff. And so how do we 
broaden the scope of teachers who experience culturally responsive teaching practices so that ultimately the responses to these change. And you can see that as students get older, the data become more disheartening. So it looks a little better in elementary. Middle school, there's a noticeable dip. And then in high school is a pretty significant dip where there are some statements where it's in the 50% for students. And so um, I think that students become more aware of the different treatment as students as they get older. Um, And I think that is why a lot of the work that we have is sometimes focused on the secondary level and some of the bigger concerns that are raised from parent groups are also at the secondary level because it becomes more obvious in in a different kind of way. You know, one thing I'm looking at uh, the middle school answers, question number 15, and you know, I'm looking at three years of data and this is the one question where the three years of data went down consecutively each year. And my question is, I don't know whether, I think, think in future reports, it would be helpful to have more years of data. I know it's always dangerous when you ask for, you know, the state of Georgia to do the same thing for more than two years in a row. We may not have more than three years of data and next year they may change it on us. So I know, and I know we'll face issues like that. Um, but when I see something like this, my initial, you know, jump to conclusion is to, you know, confirmation bias. There does seem to be kind of a, a buzz at the middle school that I'm hearing about of kids being harder on each other the last couple of years. And so I'm reading a confirmation bias into this, but I can't actually tell with only three years of data. The other thing I would share is it would not surprise me if there, if you are seeing a trend like that. um, And it shouldn't be shocking to us that the more we talk about inequity and the more we address these things, people people feel more comfortable or they recognize things that they knew was an inequity all along, but they might not have had the words to describe it, or they might not have felt the... Um, empowerment to speak up about it. And so um, I don't necessarily look at that as a bad thing. Um, If it continues and continues and continues, I would be worried about that. But it would not surprise me a bit if in a lot of this perceptual data, especially if we don't see dips like that, as people just become more aware of their surroundings and what they're experiencing and and talking about it with peers and doing all the things we want them to be doing. yeah, one, one possible that sign of too. success in our equity work could be that people say that things are worse because they're talking about it. Correct. They're finally not, it's not the quiet, you know, the hidden conversation, but it's the elephant in the room. People can talk about it. Correct. Um, and that's how I interpreted this because on the racial perception, racial equity, the perceptions have dipped. <clears throat> the more we talk about it, the more they've gone down. I mean, yeah. it's a direct line down. And unless our talking is making things worse, which is probably not the or the perception of worse. There are a lot of things that could play into it. I mean, the, even the political climate, you know, and everything we've been watching on the news for the past few years too could have influenced mm-hmm. some discussions in in the homes and in schools. Um, I would say, you know, that's an interesting way to look at it. We just can't use that as an excuse, right. Right. and we would need to back up. I mean, all of these things will be backed up with m- much other data showing academic performance and discipline statistics and all the other good things that we're working on too so that if we are showing improvement in those other areas then i think we can say that we're doing good work and our conversations are having an impact and that maybe this is more about awareness but if those other things aren't improving and there's still not improvement here or um, statistics are showing that it's actually getting worse than I would be very concerned. Mm-hmm. So I think that those two, all of those sets of data together will help us form a more complete picture. Well, and remember too, like it mentioned in the next steps about um, SOAR, the students organized against racism, like that's a perfect example of a, a group led by students of empowering mm-hmm. other students to talk about these things and move this conversation forward. Um, and it may cause some, some dips in how kids are feeling about school and things until we start embracing it and start getting to the healing point and not just focus on the, um, on the negative aspects of, mm-hmm. of what's happening. So I suppose one question that makes me ask is, 
and this is challenging because I don't have an answer and I, you may not have an answer either, but if we can have something other than just survey data. Historically, there's been a great resistance to using survey data for a lot of the reasons that we've said. Um, are there any other points of data that we can use? I don't know, I'm guessing if there were, it would already be in the report. Yep. Um, so one thing I just wanted to state about not only the content, but also how we're, we're monitoring and reporting this um, is that I, first of all, I appreciate that we're, that we are attempting to shine a spotlight on some challenges that we continue to have, but we're also talking about a report as a board at a public meeting that has not, doesn't really feel like it's been presented to the public mm -hmm. because no one else in the room is looking at the report that we're looking at right now. And this is kind of a, a change in the way that we've done things is in the past, someone from the staff will present something and it goes up on the screen and we all kind of look at it together and everyone who's in the room and people from the community who have interest in learning it are hearing it with us and following the information with us. And I feel like the way that this presentation and the monitoring report has, has kind of unfolded is I, I feel like it might have had the unintended effect of sort of um, being more of like a private report. I mean, I, I, I know that this report is online and that people can go and look at it online, um, but we don't have our meetings online. We have them in a public room at a public meeting and where we kind of present information to the public. And it just doesn't feel like this information is accessible for the purpose of a public meeting right now when no one else is looking at it but us. Maybe. And there's like, there's, you know, one book back there, but lots of other people in the room, and there's not tons of people in the room at the moment, but I'm just thinking about as we go forward, how can we really review data and hear information and talk about it in a way that is more public? Because I feel like, and, and the reason it's, it really stands out to me is this is concerning data, and if I were someone who's just sitting in the room, I don't know that I would fully appreciate just how bad this is. And, and it's not up on any screens. And we've got reports that are showing, you know, year over year, the gap between how white students perceive things in the school district is increasingly better than how black students perceive things in the school district. And, you know, in 2016, adults in the school treat, the, the question is adults in the school treat all students with respect. It was a difference of 2% between black and white students in 2016, and then it grew to 8%, um, and then it grew to 13%. Like, the, it's really troubling data, and I just sort of, it just feels like we're not presenting it publicly. I know it's online, but, but there are some limitations with online, with just accessibility to online, and I don't know. That, it just, it just doesn't, I understand, like, in terms of our time, it's quicker, and these meetings don't last as long if we just review all of this at home and then we kind of talk about it and like we just have. But I feel like the way that we've talked about it and the way that it's been presented, it doesn't feel very public. It feels like it's just a conversation that we're having that we're not really including the public in. And we're happy to do it however the board wants. The, you, you hit the nail on the head. I think the discussion previously was trying to be efficient with our meeting time, mm -hmm. which is why we don't do a whole overview of the report. And instead, we make sure it gets in the board packet and gets out there. But if the board wants us to approach it differently, we're happy to. I mean, I think what we've done on things in the past, and, and maybe there's a little bit of a compromise or um, some middle ground here, but there's been sort of a high-level presentation from a staff member, and then there's a more detailed report. And so I think this is a great example of, I, I don't think we need to go through 27 slides, um, but we could maybe go through three slides that kind of just present some kind of just, you know, aggregation of some of this information so that at least if people are here in the meetings or watching it at home and they don't have the report in front of them and they're, they, they know generally what we're talking about, as opposed to sort of feeling like you're on the outside listening to a meeting that you don't even you don't even see kind of all the, all the trouble spots. And this one, it feels like I feel particularly sensitive about um, 
especially given you know what what we're talking about in terms of ex- accessibility and calling it what it is and you know the elephant in the room <laughs> I, th- I feel like all those themes are sort of resurfacing as we're having a conversation that I don't know that the public really fully appreciates just how concerning this data is because they can't see it at the moment and I would also add with the next steps I think that's the most powerful page as well and so even if we had that on the screen um, so again you know the people sitting in the room could could see what we're talking about as, as far as the next steps are concerned mm-hmm. um, so yeah I, I would I would second that with Annie of maybe just a, a very you know smaller version of a review of you know what the report has and then if somebody does want to go dig in deeper and look at all 27 questions they certainly can um, but yeah I think it did feel kind of weird that we didn't have anything kind of up up here for people to look at um, in case they were just curious what we were talking about I think that's a good idea I, I will note that I think this format is one that we had discussed doing specifically exactly. this right, is us. that we would do yeah. our homework in advance and right. have a discussion and for the folks in the audience, the, I mean, the point is that it's a, it's a board meeting. It's our opportunity to do this work. And it's a 27-page report full of statistics. And so if we have Daryl. On one, one end. What's on that? One. On yeah. one end. Well, on one for, end. One, for one tiny little segment of one end. <laughs> right, right. Which is a point I want to return to in a second. But there's just not enough time in the day or in the meeting for you to present it thoroughly. However... Make an executive summary to kind of round the conversation and provide Just that. frame it and One kick page. it off and yeah. show kind of generally what we're talking about as opposed to just putting we're, we're the happy policy to do board that. thing I, I think we've heard that's the way you want to go, okay. and we're just trying to do what the board is asking. Yeah. So. No, this, this, was, this, was, this was totally us. Yeah. Could, we also, could we also prominently display in large enough font, maybe even a small, one of those abbreviated URLs, a link to the report so that the people who watch these meetings at home can hit the pause button, go read the report, and then hit play again. That's a good idea. I, I know that I'll be the, the, the counterpoint to this. If I read a 27 or 100 page report at home, the last thing I want to do is come to the board meeting and listen to the 27 page or 100 page report that I've already gone through and made extensive and I, notes. And that's on. not my suggestion. I understand. Okay. I understand. I think an executive summary and just the synopsis, a link to the full report and the board diving in. For those people who are interested to go into the depth, right. it gives them the opportunity to do so and makes it very easy for them to do so. And I think that would meet, I hope, the needs to make sure that everyone in our public can have access to the report. So circling back to the, and I'm, I'm kind of repeating myself, but for some reason I feel the need to, that this is the one place in our policy governance that we ask the superintendent to explain how he is meeting the single direction that we've provided in terms of the breadth of the curriculum. And so, you know, this is a spare the criticism that you get with this policy governance is that board kind of just turns it over and says do whatever. And so the way that we keep things working is that you actually give us a report that addresses the breadth of the direction. And this is a broad direction about curriculum, academics, and academic achievement. This is where we talk about the academic standards that we've set for all of our kids. And so the racial equity piece is a piece, but it is, it is a, by no means, it's almost different in kind from the academic standards that we're, that we're addressing, in, in my view, primarily through this. Again, I think it all fits in other places. <clears throat> but when we do this report, Garrett made the point that this is a public-facing document, and when our stakeholders look at it and say, well, how is it that you address, you know, multicultural education, et cetera? We're not, we have to have an answer, and, we, and it should have come in the monitoring report. And if the monitoring report is addressed solely to the equity initiative and not to the curriculum, we don't. And so I just think it's important as a public facing document. Frankly, this, I mean, we're highlighting, we're, we're, we're highlighting problems, it's true. We also need to highlight our successes. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. We're doing a good job on this stuff. We need to say so. And um, so I think that these reports, but yes. But it's clear that a, we're not doing a good job right here, though. I agree. But, right. so it, but, but, it, but you don't only say, well, I failed here. You say, look, I'm doing a good job 
on these aspects of the problem. I interpret the, the, the direction to require me to have a broad-based curriculum that's, um, you know, that's going to include... Um, I think there's a lot of stuff with IB and EL right. that could be great, you know, success stories to, to touch on the intercultural, multicultural uh, learning. Right. Um, you know, we the, should, we're doing the, ourselves a disservice, and the board is actually not doing its job if we don't get a report on those aspects as well. So, and I hear what you're saying, and it's helpful because I think you've interpreted the word ac academics to mean curriculum, which is helpful for us because the word curriculum doesn't appear in here anywhere. Right. Um, and I've heard it mentioned about a dozen times now, the curriculum. So I just, I don't that's see very helpful to see, you know what I mean? Like to right. you, academics means curriculum or a piece of academics means curriculum. And it's helpful to hear that. I hear that. I would state it a little bit differently that if not, he, if not, if curriculum doesn't fit in this policy, where does it fit? Mm -hmm. And if the board has nothing to say about curriculum, what are we doing? That's all I'm saying. I'll, I'll wedge in just a little bit. the are the means to the ends that right. are part of it. That's right. where I was going to wedge in. And these are the ends policies, not the means policies. Okay. So I think that's part of the, the that's challenge. A, that's a fair thing. But, but, but how it'd be kind of like saying that we, we succeed without teaching math. And so whether, whether we're talking about the math curriculum or the end goals related to math, um, what we're are the talking about from, understanding, <clears throat> in, you know, like where, where, do you, where do you get in our... our teaching of the history of the subcontinent of India or something, right? None of that. You could, you could hit the ball out of the park if, if it's only about the racial uh, equity, just as long as the black and white students both are equally ignorant and neither is learning anything about other cultures, and, right? No, I, I would not say that because you wouldn't be demonstrating an understanding if neither group was. By the standards set forth in this report, if the perceptions were equal, that the teachers were equally sensitive. Over 70%. No, so the, the, yeah, over 70% of the students was the goal set in the report, not the gap between the two. I understood. I, I take the correction. But my point is that um, it addresses a problem that doesn't address the end learning goal the end learning objective. What are the kids going to learn when they walk out of the school? This report doesn't address that at all. So you would like to see data that gets to like um, maybe test scores in related to academic areas that are demonstrating this multicultural or intercultural perspectives, like some academic ends that are more curriculum related. To satisfy my concern, it would not have to be test scores. Okay. It could be a discussion of how our curriculum addresses this object, this learning objective. Okay. Um, which it does. I mean, I don't have any question that it does. Could be the international perspective spotlight that we had, right. and some type of you know, the, demonstrate an understanding of the 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 results and the outcomes that the students have of that. It could be more of a portfolio based uh, instead of a. I always worry, and you know I always worry when people say curriculum, and I probably overdo it because curriculum is a means to an end. Um, but if, if we and can I would reach be fine the with end. it being more of like you were just saying, like a portfolio-based, here are some outcomes from our curriculum mm -hmm. in this area. Like that I'd be fine with. I, I don't want an ends report to end up just being, Schmort here's Schmort. all the curriculum we offer. No, that and wouldn't be. It may or may not be working. You know what I mean. Right. I mean, so. I have a feeling, like I said before, that you could go through and pull out the IB principles, <clears throat> what it means to be an IB school, because you can't be an IB school if, if you're not hitting uh, number seven. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think some words around that. Well, we would, what we would have to connect though is the outcomes that are related right. to those principles. Right, and how you right. measure it. That, I, I, I agree, it's, it's a an challenge. Issue. My, I, so I don't know exactly how to do it. Yeah. What I know is that it's not done now. Yep. And if it's not done here, I would just query where it's going to be done. Yep. It needs to be done somewhere. To Annie's point about the areas and those survey results where the gaps are growing, um, it would be nice for me, for us to have some type of a way to quantify, um, you know, for me, I would jump to like a chi-square test or something like that. It doesn't have to be that. Whatever works that shows us is that you know the the disproportionality there? Is it growing? Is it significant? You know, there's a certain point where if it's small enough, I think we can move on to the other things um, and try. You know, it's what are we going to focus on, and when do we know that that gap is big enough that it's a significant thing that we should be focusing on? So anything that can help us with that would be useful. And I mean, most of them are growing. 
I mean, unless I'm reading it, I, have, I think almost the majority of these are growing gaps. Well, and, and that's back to where, why I asked Daryl to give us his s- synopsis of what we're doing well and what we're what our challenges are because it's exactly, I think, that executive summary that brings a lot of value because you we are depending on you who work with us every day to, to give us the insight into what this data means and what, what we should be concerned about versus what we should celebrate. Okay, so who's going to volunteer to write the response? Thank you, Lewis. <laughs> I, I actually will write this one. Mm-hmm. I think you just volunteered. I, I'll do it if you're. If I'd you're. be willing to review um, if you want somebody to review it. Or we should all, do it we all need. It. Yeah, we, we all need to review it. it. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, okay. <coughs> we don't need to do anything else right now, do we? Nope. No. Okay. Thank you so much. I'm Thanks, Daryl. Thank you, Daryl. Thank yeah. Thank Thanks you, for Darryl. being this is the an first. Important first step. Thank yeah. you. It's not first. easy being the first. <laughs> well. <laughs> We, we have the property tax study committee back on, but I think that we covered it already. We covered it. Yeah. yeah. Future, uh, future dates. Um, I guess this is our standard time to talk about how we stand with the board work plan. What is our next well, board session? One of the things we need to think through is board training hours. So right now you all have six hours between now and um, June 30. We need to mm-hmm. find three more hours at some point. So that can be things like some of those GSBA. Um, summit type things they offer the only one i know of for sure is actually coming up right away on march 19th Um, they have a social emotional learning summit in jonesboro Um, there's the gsba summer pre-conference workshops so um, in savannah so if folks are planning to go to those if you go to one of the pre-conference ones you can get that or um, when we reschedule or schedule our um, retreat time we can of course have a um, authorized presenter or trainer there and can get hours that way as well. So just wanted to make sure you're aware. And of course, there's the online option, which is really not very good. But if you have to, you know, you can get the hours that way. So I would, my preference um, would try, would be for us to try to do this together. I think it's more, it's most effective when the five of us are together with someone who can certify it or whatever, we'll so it that it retreat counts. That, that's my yeah. preference. I think that's it's no problem. more impactful. I mean, so, I do enjoy videotaping myself at seven yeah. o'clock in the morning doing some I knew you really online that. exercise or whatever. Is there a way it was to awful. To <laughs> that was the worst thing ever. We can ask. That sounded interesting. We can ask. Okay. So you said this has to be done by the end of June or? Okay. Yep. And we have a retreat before then? We so don't, we but do. we needed to reschedule yeah. the uh-huh. one, so we haven't done that yet. We do have a retreat, and then we have Savannah if you're going. So we do have yep. two opportunities okay. before the end. And nothing at and the um, National School Board conference doesn't. I don't count think it counts because okay. they're not Georgia not certified, Georgia certified okay. trainers. I share Annie's preference that we do it. I find most conferences and whatnot I don't get much out of. Um, and, and most of those trainings I don't get much out of. I find the stuff that we do together be really beneficial and um, I have a strong preference for that so we'll get that scheduled um, one thing I'll mention I, I think at one point we had planned in one of our work sessions to talk about um, how our strategic priorities um, are um, basically to make sure we're telegraphing our strategic priorities so that when the conversation comes to the budget that we can connect the board's strategic priorities to how they're reflected in the budget um, I don't know that we're going to going to get there um, before we have that budget presentation, um, but I will put out there that we've done a lot of work in the past. We're continuing to do a lot of work on um, academic extracurricular and activity and, and academic barriers to activities. Um, and I think that one of the things that I hope we can do is 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 show what we're going to do in the budget. You know, when the district doubles in size but stipends and support for these types of programs don't grow in lockstep with students, then the the net reflect is that we've reduced our support for uh, these extracurricular and athletic activities. And so I hope that that can be something that we can show um, the work that we've done, that we can continue moving that forward and find a way to discuss that in the context of making sure that it's reflected in the budget. 
Um, so that's right in line because we have two work sessions between now and the end of the year, March 26th and April 30th. Which one of those is the budget one? April 30th. April 30th. And so the March 26th one, we could do the strategic priorities okay. conversation. March Th those were the two topics I had down for potential March work sessions. March 26th and April 30th are what we currently have scheduled. I have a, I have one request that's just process, which is that can we take the board work plan and append it to the back of every single agenda item so that we can. Yes, I need an updated version of that. Like I think you have the original one. I do. Mm -hmm. Because the um, there were two. There were the like the board monitoring policy uh -huh. monitoring piece which is now that calendar that's attached there so you took that piece out but exactly so mm -hmm. i think you've got the if you can get those delete those parts and have the updated calendar so i will i will send you that and then that would help okay. us go through it okay. the, the other thing is that i was thinking that i don't remember if on that schedule we had um, a discussion of eclc but i would like to have that and um, particularly is uh, um, you can when I don't know, you know, as we've discussed with the master facilities plan coming up, I think it, we need to have a discussion whether we're on the same page about mm -hmm. um, the desire to increase capacity and use tuition to subsidize tuition for others, that kind of thing. Okay. Um, we've talked about it in the past, but I'd like to make sure it's included at a, at a time when it's can lead the discussion on the facilities plan rather than follow it. Agreed. So should we, for March 26th then, should we have strategic priorities as our topic and then April 30th budget? Sure. Yep. Okay. Sounds good. Are we, I think the restorative justice report was also going to be something that we circled back on. Um, Although that I think it's a little early for that with the PBIS stuff. I just want to make sure it's still. Yep. Another thing I thought I might mention <coughs> related back to that House Bill 53 <coughs> is that it might behoove us to reach out to the city and um, maybe task uh, Bob to help look at options, strategies moving forward. Mm -hmm. just, just a general item, which is it's something that we, we both need to be working on and, and we might need some help. I think we do need some help. Is that something you want me to work on? If I mean, I'm happy to if you guys want me to. Agree. I agree. I mean, I would ask, I mean, before we go down rabbit holes, but just get some initial thoughts on options before we start doing anything. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. <coughs> do you want to do um, I would um, say emphasize what, what Lewis already said, but working together with the city on that. I mean, I feel like we need to make sure we know what they're doing already yep right and so we're not duplicating any of that but well, we working in conjunction with yep. them no problem individually schedule things with our, yes. our city counterparts okay. that is, I, that's I, always I, helpful yeah yes. we can do that first and then and then come back to david with mm -hmm. with what we have yep so the item i wanted to discuss i'll just bring up with you afterwards okay without an executive session oh okay anything else oh no that's it and unless you and went unless we you just want to have a private party. <laughs> <laughs> are we? Are we? Uh, We're good. Th this meeting is adjourned. Mm -hmm.